tonight's episode, we rejoin our Dogman encounters across the U.S. series, focusing on the East Coast this time. There's some hair-raising accounts and stories that are just as terrifying as the encounters that have happened on the West Side. Get ready, because the terror is not stopping anytime soon. Story 1 October 2000 It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer, it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't say exactly what I saw. I just asked them if they were any big dogs or wolves up where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said, no. Then he asked why. I didn't tell him anything though. The thing I will never forget are those reddish orange eyes that just kept staring at me deep into my soul. Story 2 April 22nd, 2016 I had just arrived home, a few minutes after dusk, after visiting with my parents. Our location is pretty rural, but we do have a few neighbors within shouting distance of us. We have 33 acres of mixed forests and fields with lots of thick brush, consisting mostly of briars. I had my two young children with me in the Jeep ages 2 years and 11 months old when I pulled in the driveway that night. My husband was working late, with an emergency case. It was near fully dark when I got home. As soon as I stepped out from my vehicle, I felt creeped out. It felt different outside. We have lots of peepers and crickets that would normally be making a lot of noise. Even the birds are usually chirping until an hour or more past dark. This time, there was not a sound. It was very warm that evening so the peeper should have been in full chorus. Because of my uneasy feeling, I was rushing to get the kids in the house, and at the same time, did not want to leave RJ in the car alone, for a minute as I routinely do. He and our older daughter, who was asleep, are normally too heavy for me to carry together at the same time. That night though, I grabbed them both, one in each arm, after finding my keys to the front door and carried them both. Usually, I would use the auto garage door. However, the opener did not work. When I reached the front door, at the top of the stairs and got situated on the front porch, I put down Angelina in order to open the front door. As soon as I turned my attention back to the front door, it happened. Somewhere to my left came a sound that will be forever seared into my memory. It started low and slowly increased to a moderately loud growl. It was deep-toned and very guttural, and was angry in character. It was nothing like anything I had ever heard before. But it did sound canine in origin, especially after spending an hour listening to various animal growls. The growl continued for approximately 10 seconds. I was so terrified I was fumbling with the keys. It really felt like I was dropping into an 80s horror film. I really did think I was going to die. I was sure any second the thing making this sound was going to pounce upon me and the kids and eat us right then and there on the spot. The growl sounded as though the creature was standing just off to my left. I refused to look out of fear of what I would see. It sounded so close and or even above eye level with me. My porch extends another five feet to the left, and then off the porch is the front of the house. There's 35 yards of grass to the edge of the tree line, and there's a field with two foot tall grass opposite of that. There's also a small shed between our porch and the tree line. Standing on the front porch from my head to the ground is approximately nine feet, so I assume it was standing near the corner of the house. I had never been so afraid until a few moments later when it actually spoke to me. As the growl continued, 
it seemed to melt into audible words, spoken in a very deep and gruff tone that seemed to have a rough sort of reverberation quality to them. What I heard as clear as day was, you can't get in. The only word that I'm sure of is the first, you. As the sound of the growl transitioned to English words and it sounded more like, yeek. Now, I was finally hysterical and dropping the keys. Finally, I got the right one in and got the door open and got in. I had to kick my daughter through the door, regretfully. Strangely, she seemed oblivious to what had just transpired, as if she didn't hear it. I slammed the door shut and never looked. I didn't hear anything else that night. I called my husband and his friend to let them know what had happened. So I never did actually see what terrorized me, because I couldn't look. I've had two days to think about this encounter and talk with my husband, who has listened to just about every episode of Dogman Encounters with Vic Hundiff. I'm fairly certain that this was what was growling at me. The sound was not human and seemed like it was amped or mic'd up because it seemed so powerful. Not that it was a loud growl, but it seemed unnatural. Also, the height it seemed to emanate from and the silence that preceded it led me to the conclusion. My husband agrees, because the entire week he too has been on edge. We have lived here for a year and all seem normal until this very week. Our cat, which is an indoor cat, got out accidentally and has vanished, without a trace, mind you. She has gotten out before and just stood around until we got her back in the house. Also, my husband said that Tuesday night he experienced the same silence outside and it really unnerved him too. He says he has never experienced anything so eerie. On Wednesday, he took our dog up into the woods to look for our cat and felt very uneasy. He said the dog kept tucking its tail and turning around wanting to go home. It's not like our dog or even my husband to feel uneasy in the woods because both of them love the outdoors and are very comfortable in nature. On Thursday at dusk, he took the dog around the back lot and says something took off from the thicket at a sprint and came crashing through the woods down the hill towards him. He always carries a sidearm when he is out and is normally not really afraid of anything, but he actually turned and ran back up towards the house. Whatever was charging stopped seconds after he stopped to listen and did not make another sound. He was very concerned when he came in, stating that he knows what big game sounds like and that this was just not right. Even he was surprised that he ran from the sound. The following day was when my encounter happened. After talking about all these events with my husband, we are concerned that there is a dogman in the area. My husband had listened to episodes 90 and 91 of Dogman Encounters with Vic Cundiff and is so worried that this thing has decided to stalk one or both of our children. My husband said that based on those episodes, it sounds like the Dogman plans ahead when snatching kids and he thinks it may have been scouting the area with plans to do just that. He said it was doing that or that it was waiting for me to leave one of the kids in the Jeep for just a minute. Either way, none of this is good. The main reason why I wanted to submit this to you was because it seems very unique in that it spoke to me. It wasn't the words, but the feeling it gave me that disturbed me the most. It was as if it was trying to give me the impression that I was nothing and that I was weak and just food. I got the impression that it was saying, can't get in, ha <laughs> ha, you're mine. It's tough to explain because it seemed like it was conveying its frame of mind and that was, for lack of better description, mocking me in a very cruel way. I really want to know if you have ever heard of one of these monsters actually speaking. My husband and I really want to believe that our conclusions are wrong, but instinct and other encounters have highly convinced us that it in fact was a dogman. Story 3 A park ranger, John Irwin, was traveling through a deserted road within the forest and had reached a spot where the Molokka River, next to the road, 
when up ahead his headlights shone on a large dark figure that was emerging from the woods and was moving into the roadway. As he got closer, the figure stood in front of the car, blocking the roadway. Irwin had to stop his car in order to avoid hitting the creature. The creature was described as being well over six foot tall and covered with black fur that looked wet and matted. It appeared not to have any forelegs, but had a pair of huge, powerful hind legs. The creature glanced through the windshield of the car, revealing two piercing red eyes. It stood a few moments and then turned and continued across the road, walking upright like a human in a peculiar robot-like fashion. Story 4 June 1, 2017 I was going through the hiking trails with my dog behind my town's local high school fairly late one night. I had gone there plenty of times before since I was young, so I wasn't frightened. While I was walking my dog, he kept trying to stop and was whimpering, which was strange because he is normally a very brave dog. After walking for about 10 minutes longer, I heard huge branches crashing and breaking. That's when I started to become frightened and decided to turn back. While walking back, I could tell that something was following me. I was terrified. Suddenly, after a minute of calmness, this creature leaped in front of me across the trail. The creature had long, dark fur and was enormous. It wasn't a bear. It was like a very muscular, huge wolf. After seeing this, I picked up my dog and sprinted off the trail without ever seeing it again. That was easily one of the most terrifying nights of my life. Story 5 Since it was summer break for my school, I was lazily lounging at home, watching TV. I got bored, so I went outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens, like feed them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, I should explain the area I live in. My home is on the outskirts of the city I live in. I had about five or seven chickens at the time, and we hadn't expanded the coop yet, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken coop, which is wooden and sturdy. The only ways to get into the coop is either through the trap door, attached to the big door, and the three windows. One window is on one side of the door, and the second window is on the other side. The third window is a large window. Keep in mind that they all have traps connected to them so they can be closed. We have seven acres of woodland that we call the back pasture, and if you've ever been back there, you could see that it's a popular habitat for the local deer. There was also a wild boar that was roaming around at the time, and I don't know how it got there. We had been having troubles with poachers for a while, considering the population of deer in the woods. One poacher had set up a trail cam, one that was motion activated. There was an old rusty deer stand that had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had begun to grow around it. Beyond our acres of woods, there's a large cornfield owned by our neighbors and beyond that is a forest. I don't know what the forest is like beyond that field since we've never been there. I went outside to do something with my chickens and had brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer afterwards. When I walked out of my house, I saw a doe was sitting in the tall grass. I thought it was sleeping since its head was down and it wasn't moving. I, being the curious little nut that I was, decided that I would sneak up on the deer and get a picture of it to show my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across that yard that separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we have a clearing with a burn pit in it that was filled with cedar branches. I was creeping across my yard towards the deer, and when I had cleared the burn pit and was about 10 yards from it, I realized that the deer wasn't asleep, but it was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I had ever seen. Its intestines were completely gone, the flesh on the body of the doe shredded to pieces, and blood everywhere. It looked as if it had been sitting there for a while, and smelt like it too. Most of the blood was dried, and the air reeked with the stench of rotting flesh, urine, and what seemed to be like a hint of wet dog. Something that creeped me out about the scene was although it was a rotting carcass, 
there were no insects at all around it. It was as if the usual lively forest was deader than the deer. Not even the neighbor's cattle made a sound. It looked as if the poor deer had simply been left after being brutally attacked and half eaten, which it most likely was. I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, thinking that I would come out later with my mother and grain the deer when she got home. Then I started to walk back to my house. I had barely taken a few steps when I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf, although it seemed distorted as if it were being played on an old radio. Against my better judgment, I turned my head around and I saw what looked like the biggest freaking wolf I'd ever seen. It was on all fours. Its fur was black and matted in places. Its face was what you'd expect a wolf to look like, although it was broad and the muzzle seemed a little short. Although the way it was curling its lips made it look as if the snout was plenty long, and its eyes, its eyes were yellow. Not a bright yellow, like the yellow of a flower or the sun, but a dim, deep, amber-red yellow, if that makes sense. Its ears looked like that of a Doberman pincher, with a cropped effect going on. Its front legs were long, and it looked as if it were a bodybuilder. Its paws, if you can even call them paws, looked like huge hands with long claws at the end of them. It stood up, and I heard the most sickening popping sound you could ever imagine. It sounded like the sound of popping joints, but it seemed amplified as if it were being played through a microphone. Its body looked like a bodybuilder's pumped up on steroids. It was so big. It had no tail that I could tell, and it seemed to tower over me, although I was a good 10 meters from it. I was about 5 foot 4 inches at the time, and I came nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar. It let out a very loud howl, which sounded more like a roar, and it charged me. Doing the only thing I knew to do while hyped up on fear and adrenaline, I began to run away. I remember clearing my yard in what seemed like hours, but was most likely only a few seconds, and running inside, slamming and locking all the doors and windows. As I calmed down a small bit, I had realized that if it had really wanted to kill me, that it would have, and that what I experienced was not an attack, but a bluff charge, very common for many predators in the wild. I was lucky to get away with my life. Although this happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer was gone the next day, and ever since that evening I have been weary around those woods, only going in them in broad daylight, only when I absolutely had to, and never without a weapon. Sadly, I cannot say that I am one of those people that have stopped experiencing things after the encounter although I only had nightmares for a month after that day in June. Nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago when I was staying up at night playing on the laptop. I had started to hear things moving around on the porch and turned on the light to see the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. There was also one of the rare times I went into the woods after the first encounter when I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing. I was going to get the mower and was walking the trail to do so when I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to my side. They stopped wherever I stopped and I eventually ran out of the woods and have never been back since. I asked my late grandmother about the creature I had seen and she informed me that there was something called the Wolfhead Man that stalked the Kansa tribe, preying on small children that strayed too far from their tents. Later. I was informed by my history teacher that my house had actually been built on a tribal burial ground, and I have since been wondering if that had anything to do with it. I hadn't heard about the Wolfhead Man before she told me about it. When I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proved to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had attempted to tell people previously to this, but everyone either said I was stupid, crazy, or just a liar. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid. I am not crazy and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw and what I saw is a dog man. Story 6 I'm reporting a possible dogman sighting based on the info provided by my son and his friend. 
This occurred in Montgomery, Massachusetts. As a four-wheel enthusiast, my older son has become familiar with off-roading trails and rural routes that he and his friends use regularly, often at nighttime. On this occasion, they were in his Ford Explorer, following a familiar route in a rural town through a remote wooded area. Being winter, the plows stopped at a certain point, leaving a bank of snow at that point, marking where the town abandoned maintenance of that unpaved road for the winter, leaving further use of this road to those who dare. As my son related, he four-wheeled through the snowbank and drove along the rain road, which winded a mountain. He concentrated on his driving, focusing on the road, as his close friend sat in the front passenger seat. Suddenly, his friend exclaimed, Look, what is that? My son didn't lift up his eyes to see it because he wanted to stay on the road. His buddy pointed to where it went. So, my son quickly swung his truck around and illuminated the area with his off-road lights and headlights. His friend described what he saw as running like a wolf, but not a wolf. He said it was big like a bear, but not a bear. He also said it had long hair and was lighter in color than a brown bear. He said it was gray in color. They sat there for a minute or so, staring into the darkness. Suddenly, something pushed the SUV from behind, making it slide along the muddy, snowy road just a short distance. They both whipped their heads around, only to see the blackness of night, out of the rear window. Then he quickly started the truck and sped out of there, not seeing the creature again. My son stated that it could not have been the same creature his buddy spotted, because once he had illuminated the area with the truck's lights, they would have spotted movement against the white snow. Another one of my friends insisted this was a Bigfoot, as he had an encounter years ago, but this description seems to better fit a dogman. This experience, whatever it was, is absolutely true. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. I'm working on releasing videos daily, and I'll keep covering a wide range of topics, from gargoyles, to creepy camping stories, to dogmen, and much, much more. Keep your eyes and ears peeled, and stay afraid for what lurks in the darkness around you. Tonight, we finally begin our series on United States Southern Dogmen and Werewolf Encounters. This episode takes us through seven frightening encounters from Tennessee as well as North Carolina and more. So sit back and enjoy the scare. Two thousand two. I am a thirty-two year old female from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks, all that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Tomlesom Run, Beaver Creek, State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park and I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, including koi dogs and bears, and I can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes, I was a dino crazy little girl. My one babysitter had Reader's Digest Mysteries of the Unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an apostasaur in the Congo was just mind blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing but I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It did seem to me, though, that it seems I didn't need to go looking, though. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about 10. 
Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted, mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say, it sounded like it. No one was home, no media was on, and yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where, and the sound of the furniture being dragged right under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Hell, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I think it was a horse that had gotten loose, but when I'd go out to investigate, I wouldn't find a thing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 and 19 in this particular encounter, and by this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate cows, and just had horses and chickens. Someone knocked at the door, and it was at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep for two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working at the time, and that was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you could literally have to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch black. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence again. It happened a lot, believe it or not. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads and paused for a moment to see if there was any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse the woods and lead them back. And even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky trek. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. So the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long, which then connects to a seven acre pasture Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of a large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still on the fence so I can bring her down to the small pasture, just to keep her from escaping too. Maybe the others would follow. I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psycho horse. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled a few times trying. She was frothing at the mouth, and her eyes white were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho. I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny, little fenced-in area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over 16 hands tall. One was a draft horse cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides, going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral, and the last time she got out, much to my frustration, was an awesome jumper. So, a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. 
I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had a couple of different Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, and other thoroughbreds and mustangs, and all different kinds. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, no matter what breed it is, especially not in a group. They were just silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed any help, but I told him no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead them out. They had other plans though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chests pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such a bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60 all the time. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road though. I was a little unnerved by their strange behavior. so. I led them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish at first though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around relentlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalized it by thinking, it's the appy flipping out that's unnerving them, and why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I can make out her shape in some detail though. She took off at a panicked gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself through and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego licking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of the pasture again. The pasture was not even, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime though, during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to be seen. The spot on the road though, where I was at, was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eye shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees and my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on one of it it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen standing there, watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil, and then I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods, above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eyeshine. I didn't see any though. So, I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there, watching frozen. 
someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising though. The horses were still restless and making noise. I stood there a long time after looking for the eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I don't think so though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before and he made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with the bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point and I considered leaving the couple hundred of dollars of tack at his house. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning and my mom would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them and ran like a bat out of hell. I should have left the tack. I know, you're not supposed to run but I couldn't even conceive what I had just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tack down and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves me that whatever it was was watching me for however long. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping Appy Mare from coming down? Was it right there in the shadows while I was trying to catch her? Or was it in the unlit barn I walked through to get to the road? Was it the reason Appy swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find out how they got out. Did they panic and jump? I did check the fence line away from the woods and I did look for other tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost in the morning. But I will say the appy mare was running for a good while and the ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. To this day, I'm not quite sure what it was that I felt and experienced. I just hope that it never comes back around my horses ever again. Date unknown. My stepdad lived in Virginia when he was around the age of eight right at the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp. According to him, he was in bed one night when the sky was cloudless or just very bright. He never thought until recently whether the moon was shining or not and saw a beast looking right at him through his window. He said he could see spittle running down its face and its eyes were looking straight at him. It was supposedly standing on its hind legs and had cream, red, and brown colored matted fur and a face almost like a wolf. Other than its snout, its facial features were very human. Its jawbones were high and the structure around its eyes and its eyes themselves were human-esque. The coloring of its eyes he believes were yellow. The reason why I think this is interesting and possibly valid is because the Great Dismal Swamp covers a huge amount of territory and is hardly touched by humans. Only in recent years have people started to study its inhabitants. The grounds are wet, mossy, and absorb sound quite well. People have been known to wander into it and never return. Who knows what could be lurking in the unknown. Just chills my bones to think about. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that he crawled out of his bed and went straight to his mother's room. In the morning, when they looked around the house, all the windows had ground that was stirred up under them and the grass was yanked out. There were actual scratches in the wood under his window, and paint was missing too. However, as far as they could see, there were no discernible footprints. Story 3 Date Unknown Just thought I would report this as a potential dogman hearing, not a sighting. Multiple co-workers of mine in Shelby County, Tennessee, medical facility have heard a strange creature screaming and making crystal clear sounds behind the facility. It is well lit, fenced, but there are woods behind and also a river bottom near. Three separate people have heard the noise, two together, one at an earlier time last summer. This most recent event happened within the last month. 
When discussing it, the third person confidently says that they had also heard the noise in the pre-dawn house while getting something from their vehicle and couldn't believe it, so they had never mentioned it to anyone. After hearing the details of what the other two heard, the third person confided, all three are medical professionals, have outdoor experience and cannot identify the creature making the sounds. They describe it as being loud, crystal clear, and even though it was from an obvious distance, the call was loud enough to be heard clearly from within a running car with defroster blowing. This occurred at twilight, roughly 6 to 7 a.m. Also, since this occurred near shift change, there were several ladies coming into work who obviously heard the noise too and rushed inside the building, as observed by the two who were leaving. Story 4 Date unknown. Laugh at me. I really don't care. I don't know what I saw, but it looked like a cross between a guy and a wolf. I shit you not. I was on my way home from work. I was maybe 10 minutes away from the house, coming up a big hill. I suddenly got the strangest feeling. So, I slowed down, thinking a deer was going to come out of the woods, or something. I just felt like I was being watched, or followed. There were no cars in front of me, or behind me. I got to the top of the hill and slammed on my brakes, because as soon as I got to the top of the hill, this huge, black, hairy thing came bounding across the road. It was so big that when it ran, its back arched up, kind of like a cheetah, but only a lot more than that. I know that if it would have stood up, it would have been well over six feet tall, maybe even taller. I also know another car saw it too, because when I hit the brakes, another car turned onto that road and slammed onto their brakes too. We both just sat there for a few minutes which was not really safe considering it, I know, but we were in shock. I truly have no idea what it was that I saw. It was not a dog or a horse. Dogs do not get that big or arch their backs like this thing did when it was running. The arms and legs, whatever it had, were so long, it was having to throw them out to the side. Think kind of like a crab walk, just to run. And the appendages it had were just as big as it was. It ran from one side of the woods to the other, non-stop, like it was either going after something or running away from something. I honestly have no idea what the holy freaking hell it was that I saw, and I don't care if you laugh at me, I know what I saw. Story 5 2012 I'd like to tell you about the encounter my son had. Maybe four years ago, he had told me about it then, but I had no clue. Now we have dogman encounters, and now I know. Here's what happened. My son's friend was driving him home about 11 p.m. through a rural residential area. The houses are spaced some distance apart. They were on a two-lane highway with no streetlights and very little traffic. The area is not overly wooded, but has patches of trees and fields. This area would probably be included in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains. Anyway, they were driving along when suddenly, from the right side of the road, this thing sprang out and was across the road and into the bushes on the other side in just two leaps or bounds, or steps, or however you want to say it. It was in full view because of their headlights. My son said the first thing he thought was dog. He went on to say that it was running on all fours like a deer. He said it was the cooler version of a deer with a huge dog head, massive shoulders, and a really small waist. He kept repeating just how big it was, so I asked for a comparison. I asked if he meant huge like maybe big deer or was it maybe as tall as a cow? He answered and can quote his answer. Mom, this thing was massive. If we had hit it, the car would have gone underneath it and its body would have hit the windshield. I don't remember what kind of car it was, but it was about the size and shape of one of those older Sentras. He said that neither he or his friend said anything for about 10 seconds, and then his friend yelled, Did you see that? My son said yes, and they didn't say another word the rest of the way. And that's it. It's really creepy to me, and I thought other listeners might like to hear about it. Story 6 July 
1990. I was around nine years old or so and was at my mom's friend's house because they were having a little get together. My mom's best friend at the time decided to go get something, which was at a house nearby, down a dirt road, in the woods. My mom's friend decided to take me and friend with her. I wish I had never gone with her. We rode out with her over there and when she got out, my friend and I stayed in her car and waited for her to come back. After sitting in her car for 10 minutes, we decided to get out to see what was taking her so long. When we did that, she told us to get back in the car, so we did. As it turned out, she was buying weed, so we weren't welcome in the house. So my buddy and I got back in her car and waited for her to come out. They had a lot of bulldogs on that property. The dogs had all been barking like crazy and then just stopped all at once and went to their dog houses. That's when my friend and I saw this thing that looked like some kind of werewolf coming from behind the car. We froze and just stared at it as it walked by. Wow, it looked so evil and demonic. When we saw it, we ducked down and laid on the floorboards, and we lay there for what seemed like forever until we heard my mom's friend hitting on the driver's window trying to get us to let her in. I guess it left when I heard her come out of the house or something. Who knows, maybe it was lurking around the area, just waiting for the right time. Story 7 On the night I had my brief encounter, it was unusually slow. During slow parts of my night, I park outside the facility I work out of and watch the wildlife. It's abundant, with a mixture of fox, coyotes, raccoons, and every once in a while, I'll spy a red wolf breaking the wood line, trotting across an open field in search of small game. Our facility is located on a dead-end street, which backs up to a major creek, and to the left, we have a smaller creek that breaks off to the larger one. Both creeks are fed by a large river about a mile away. I should also mention that we have large patches of woodland that lead to our facility that the area does not have a lot of light until you turn into the parking lot. About a week prior to my encounter, I would sit at the end of the road to complete my paperwork and wait for the next call to come. As I parked there, I would get a sense of being watched. I would look up, almost expecting someone to be standing in front of my truck. Let me say that darkness or the woods does not spook me in the slightest, or even make me jumpy. I was raised in the swamp, close to a river, and rather enjoy the solitude. Not only did I have a sense of being watched and sharing my space with someone, I noted that there were no normal night sounds, such as crickets and frogs and what have you. I also found it baffling that all the wildlife seemed to be gone from the area. This really bothered me and I couldn't figure it out. On the night I had my encounter, I decided to leave some wet dog food at the edge of the wood line, hoping to entice a family of raccoons out so I could at least see that they were okay. This family of raccoons I had watched grow up from kits and not seeing them bothered me. Also, I didn't see a gray fox that would hang around that area. This fox would come within four to five feet from you but would be guarded all the while. He would hang out with certain people and then retreat back into the woods. Anyway, I popped the top off some smelly dog food and as I was pulling the top of the can, I heard a deep growl come from the out of the edge of the wood line. I had never heard an animal growl with such force and so deeply. At first, I thought it could have been a jake break from the interstate. That can be heard from our facility, but that's not what it was. I could feel hear it from the wood line hitting my face and felt the growl inside of my chest, pretty much like a vibration. I knew this wasn't a bear, the same as someone knows their left hand from their right. You just know. And yes, we do have bear here, but I can tell you quite bluntly and very firmly, this was not a bear or any other wildlife that was normal to the area. I dropped my head down and refused to look up. I dumped the can of food on the ground with one hard thump hoping whatever it was in the wood line would rather have the can of food instead of me. I backed away from the food with my head down until I reached my truck. My instinct told me to drive away, and so I did. About a half an hour later, I returned and due to my curiosity overruling my common sense, 
Being a natural skeptic, I was prepared to figure out the earlier event. I parked in the same place and this time had walked to the back of my truck to smoke. While standing there, I observed a dark mass come across the road and disappear into an open field that is mostly overgrown with wild blackberry bushes and grass. I have a trained eye. I have a trained eye. I take in a lot of detail and still, I had to admit suffering from short-term memory loss due to a TBI that ended my law enforcement career. What I saw at that moment though will be in my memory forever. I can only describe this creature as what I took at the time to be some kind of hybrid. Although it was on all fours, to me, it did not appear natural by any means. It moved with very quick, fluent motions. Looking back, I was most surprised by the creature having the intelligence to attempt to appear natural. Something was off with its gait though. It was kind of like the front legs were pulling its body forward. The back was hunched at the shoulders and it had a long back. The creature itself was black, which I can only describe as a dark mass with really no reflection. I also noted it had a small animal in its mouth. The strange part was that I could see the definition of most of the small animal compared to the darkness of the creature that I now believe to be a dog man. The snout was long, but fit its body. What struck me most were its ears. They were folded back like you might see on a Dutch Shepherd or even a German Shepherd. I guess with my background, working with dogs, the ears were clearly defined to me. I can't say what kind of tail it had or what color its eyes were. I just know it was there one minute and gone the next. When daylight came, I looked for tracks but listened to my gut and did not enter that field looking for it. The ground leading out of the smaller creek was covered in grass and what dirt was there was hard. I was left baffled but more amazed than anything. I sat on my experience for several months. I didn't tell anyone about it. I then started searching the internet for what I had seen. I guess in my mind I wondered if it was some type of hybrid creature created by man and had somehow escaped. I found several sites on the internet but none seemed to come close to what I had seen. Nothing until I came across a picture of a supposed dogman. If you take what I saw and stand it upright, instead of being on all fours, that's what I saw. Without a doubt, I'm pretty sure this dogman was a young adult, but it wasn't overly massive. What I ponder the most is the fact that the dogman had to catch my scent before clearing out the woodline. I know scent. I know how it works. The dogman knew I was there before coming out of the woods. I suppose that will be the answer I will never have. After a few months of just keeping my experience to myself, I spoke with a few of my coworkers. Of course, they told me it was a bear or a large wolf, but they did acknowledge that the wildlife had disappeared for a while. I was told to share my story, but I think it was only so my coworkers could get a good laugh at me behind my back. I stand by what I saw, although I don't speak about it much because of people like him. As I write this, I'm once again on the night shift, parked at the same spot where I had my encounter. I'm pretty sure that Dogman has left the area. Wildlife is back and the night sounds are all around. I guess I will always wonder if it will come back again. But I can't say I will ever walk in the woods at night again by myself looking for animal tracks. Thanks for watching this video. If you like my content, subscribe and be sure to leave a comment. Stay tuned since we're going to start having a lot of really cool stories come down the pipeline. Not only just werewolf and dogmen, but stories no one has ever heard of or has ever been released, period. I got the dirt that people want. Stay tuned. With this video, we approach the last nine encounters in the Western United States Dogman Encounter series. We look at encounters from Colorado, Oregon, California, and even Arizona. Enjoy this third installment and get ready to be spooked. Story 1 Well, I'm 24 years old, male, and live in the middle of nowhere. Literally. I will be short and simple about my encounter. 
I was getting home late one day after dropping my sister off at the airport in Lamar, Colorado. I live just under 7 miles north of the Oklahoma border on a roughly 250 acres of land. I have a trap line running around my property for coyotes. The first two traps I checked were empty, so I headed south. That's when I saw this thing. Now at first, I thought it was a coyote, just a really big coyote. It was almost 5 feet tall and on all fours. It was caught in my trap and was running around making a dust cloud. And then it stopped and looked right at me. Now I use a Duke number 3 leg hole trap so I can catch a variety of things in it. Anyway, I slammed on the brakes and my truck stalled. Because it's a manual, I was fumbling for the keys to start it. It's an old farm truck with a carburetor on it and it had quite an afterfire. Once it heard that, it lunged at me and roared. I saw that it had its hand, not paw, but an actual hand, caught in my trap. Well, the right hand to be exact. It had been probably looking for the dead rabbit I had in the bait hole next to the trap. It then stood up and ripped the two earth anchors I had 24 inches in the ground right out. It took me a long time to put them in with a 10 pound hammer, but it pulled them straight out like it was nothing in just 15 seconds. After it did that, it just stood there looking at me. It felt like an eternity and I knew my 357 Magnum would do nothing to stop this thing if it came at me. I prayed to God Almighty that it wouldn't come for me in my truck. I was looking at it in shock and awe and noticed that it had orange amber eyes. They weren't glowing. Instead, they had a tint like a cat's eyes in the dark. They may have been reflecting my headlights. I can't be too sure. It then took a step towards me, curled its upper lip showing me its teeth. They were humongous. The longest two had to have been four to five inches long easily. It then growled at me and then it was gone in the blink of an eye. I was scared shitless then. I jammed the truck into gear and spun the tires getting out of Dodge. Like I said earlier, it seemed like an eternity, but it must have lasted no more than 30 seconds at max. I had later returned with an Indian friend of mine. I grew up with him and trusted him. He told me some stories that were passed down through his grandparents' tribe and mentioned something about a loop guru or the French werewolf. He also told me how fur trappers in the late 1700s to 1800s were chased off the land in the Rockies from this creature. Story 2 On August 27, 2016, my 10 year old grandson was sitting in a car at a restaurant parking lot waiting for his paternal grandmother. Across the street from him, on a sidewalk, he noticed a large creature, which I determined to be 7 to 8 feet tall from talking with him. It was walking on two legs towards a wooded area at the end of a sidewalk and disappeared into some brush. The creature did not appear concerned about my grandson, as it was in no hurry. When I asked him about what he had seen, he described a classic canine type dogman with red eyes. His distance from the creature was approximately 30 feet. Daly City is a semi-rural with many pockets of woodlands and some tracts of forest. The area where he saw the creature has paved roads and sidewalks, ringed with areas of trees. Story 3 1953 The encounter I'd like to share is not my own, but that of my mother. She used to tell me stories when I was young about strange things she had experienced in her lifetime. I remembered this dogman type of encounter while listening to many dogman shows on YouTube. There's not particularly a lot of detail to this encounter, but what you might find interesting is the location. The sighting took place in Sacramento, California around 1953, not too far from our state's capital. Using Google Maps to get an approximate location and lay of the land, I could see the sighting area was about a thousand feet to the west and of perpendicular to the American River. Across the river from the east bank, it's only about another 2,000 east to the state capital. So, this took place fairly close to a heavy populated area. 
My mother states that when she was about 12 years old, she was lying on the couch watching television. That's when she noticed a scary dog face looking at her through a low pane window. The window was either on or by the door. I am unclear on this fact. In any event, the head, she said, must have been about two to two and a half feet above the ground. She covered her face in fright with her pillow. After a minute or so, she snuck a peek, figuring she must be imagining things. She saw it was gone and felt a little better. Then she noticed it was now looking through another higher window. Its head was now about four to four and a half feet above the ground, according to her recollection. There was nothing outside that window for a dog to stand on, and at that point, she just ran to another room in terror. She doesn't really recall what happened after that. She describes the animal as being dark gray with glowing red eyes, seemingly panting or baring its teeth. She didn't see the body, but had the impression that it was thin. Unfortunately, she doesn't recall the time of day, month, or season. My parents tell me there's likely some American Indian burial grounds in the area, as there had been excavations near the river, which yielded Native American arrowheads and other artifacts. I even asked my mother if there were cornfields around the area, since that has to have been mentioned in past encounters. She said only the small patch of corn stalks in their own backyard. I don't think that qualifies. The area around my grandparents' house was not really wooded. The neighborhood was mostly just large fields with a few horses and some cattle. The areas around the river is wooded now though, and was probably a lot more so in 1953 than it is today. Another paranormal story about this area is that on Monster Quest episode detailing the Mothman. Someone supposedly was taking dusk or night shot picture of the Tower Bridge in 2009 and happened to see a flying humanoid shape or something off of the bridge. The Story 4 I was walking out on the Jedediah Smith Redwood State Park in the Stout Memorial Grove. It is approximately one mile in circumference. I was going to go to the left and circle around, but there were two young guys that started to walk off trail to a big tree, so I went to the right. Fifty foot down the trail, I heard a loud roar mixed with two screams, then dead silence. I thought it was the two guys messing around, but I didn't hear any laughter after it. The hair on my arm stood up wondering what it was. I turned around immediately to leave because it was getting late around 8.40 or so, and the sun was starting to set. About 20 feet back down the trail, I noticed a black figure standing about 120 feet from where the two young guys were standing earlier. At first, I thought it was a bear standing up because it was roughly about 7 feet tall and backlit by the sun. The face was partially obscured by a branch, and it was too far away to smell. I took two quick pictures of it and left. I didn't realize what I had photographed until later on when I looked at them myself. Story 5 In October of 1972, my husband, our two babies, my brother, and I had left Leavenworth, Kansas in our 1968 Volkswagen van on a camping trip to a recreational area in Arkansas called Beaver Lake. When we finally got there, we found a fairly remote campsite at the far end of the park. We wanted to be alone as the babies woke often during the night and needed to feed. We didn't want to disturb any other campers. Shortly after pulling into our campsite, my brother pitched his tent next to the van. The rest of us were going to sleep in the van. The campsite was in an area with a horseshoe-shaped rocky terraced ledge that rose from 50 feet to around 100 feet as it curved around behind the four campsites. Because of mature trees and thick brush, daylight had trouble poking into our spot. Fast forward to that night. Sometime around 3.30 a.m., I heard some animal sounds on the ridge that I thought were being made by coyotes. The babies were asleep and all was quiet otherwise. I peered out the window but couldn't see what it was that was making sounds because it was so dark. Still hearing odd yips and howls, I had laid back down and on the back seat. Moments later, there was a huge crashing bang on the van wall right next to my head. 
My husband leapt up out of a full sleep. My brother bolted out of his tent and jumped into the van with us. We were all in panic to say the least, looking in every direction trying to see what had hit the van like that. My brother finally yelled that he saw something moving behind the van. We all turned just in time to see a large shadow moving about 20 feet behind the van from left to right. After about 20 minutes had passed without any of us seeing movement out there, my husband and brother went out to inspect the van for damage, but found none. We then started hearing pounding steps coming from the brush about 50 feet behind us. The guys eased back into the front seat of the van and that's when my husband turned on the headlights and stepped on the brake pedal for the rear light. Instantly, there was a huge commotion. He started the engine and that's when, in the glow from the headlights, we could see a hairy thing 10 feet away and coming toward the van. As it got closer, its silver-tipped hairs glistened in the light. It had a grayish streak from its shoulders down to its back to its buttocks. The creature was walking on two legs and was around seven to eight feet tall and it had a barrel chest and skinny legs. It never gave us a good view of its eyes, so I can't tell you what they look like. I could see that the face was not ape-like at all. It was very dog-like. Its ears had tufts of fur on top of them, and it was very human-like in its movements and general body structure. It moved smoothly and quickly around to the back of the van where it followed the base of the ridge away from us, and that's when it leapt out a menacing huff and a low rumbling growl like a dog. Insanely, my husband and brother bolted from the van trying to get a better look. That's when a shower of gravel came at us. My husband and brother tore back into the van and burned up the road just getting us out of there. I kept looking in the back window and they looked in the rear view mirrors, but none of us ever saw it again. It just didn't seem like a Sasquatch was what we had seen. It seemed too dog-like in its face and was too slim in its body. I still have PTSD like feelings to this day just from the encounter alone. Story 6 August was 17 years old at the time. My dad and mom had taken my little brother and sister to Tucson to do something for the day. We lived in a trailer in a rural area outside of Sierra Vista. We had two horses, two dogs, a cow, and chickens on the small amount of land we had. As the oldest son, it was my job to feed and take care of them. On the night in question, it was a stormy monsoon rain with thunder and lightning going on. But, like monsoons can be, they rage and then settle into a lull, and rage again. I was getting ready to settle down and watch a good movie, when all of a sudden, my two dogs started barking and wouldn't shut up when I told them to calm down. In the previous week or so before that, my dogs had been acting up and barking a lot at night. I attributed this to coyotes that I heard howling in the night. So, I got my dad's rifle and just one bullet in case I had to shoot to scare off the coyote or kill it if rabid. I rested the loaded rifle near the wall by the back door and turned on the floodlights outside the trailer. The rain had just stopped, so I looked out by the window near the front door and saw our two horses and cows staring as if through the front door to the back door of the trailer where the dogs were barking. I thought, maybe they're scared of the coyotes. So I grabbed the rifle and opened up the back door. As I was getting near the back door, I heard my dogs whimpering and crying. Now I was thinking, is it be a pack of coyotes? So I put a few bullets in my pocket, figuring I could load them if I didn't like what I saw. I opened the door and the darndest thing happened. My two dogs beeline rushed past me to the center of the trailer and hunkered down in the kitchen. Mud is everywhere on the floor from their paws and I'm pissed because now I have to clean this up. So I closed the door and go to try to get my dogs out, but they wouldn't budge and squirmed out of my arms when I tried to grab them. They were terrified. Now I was mad at the coyotes and grabbed the rifle to go run them off or kill them if I had to. The trailer sits on a foundation of blocks. The front and back doors are accessible by a set of small stairs. I'm 5'6 by the way. I opened the back door and was looking out in the darkness at that point. 
I was about to step out when I saw a set of eyes looking back at me out of the darkness. From the top of my head in the trailer to the ground is around 7 plus feet or so, and here is a set of eyes looking at me level and square on. I'm like, darn coyote must be on the small gravel hill we used to pave the road, or it's a bird on a mesquite bush. But I was thinking to myself, that moonshine was awfully bad and rained hard. What kind of bird would hunker down on a mesquite bush, and why would a coyote be out in a downpour? So I'm raising my rifle and drawing a bead on the eyes, when lightning lights up the night. All of a sudden, the lightning illuminates the small gravel hill, and that's like six feet high and the surrounding mesquite bushes. The light winks out as fast as it appeared from the lightning. There was nothing on the gravel hill, and no bird on any of the bushes. Then it dawned on me. Whatever it was, it was very tall and was still staring at me. A sense of dread crept over me, and all of a sudden, as I realized that the rifle only had one measly bullet, and if I missed, there was no way I'd be able to reload. Before it was on me, I kept the gun pointed at it as I quickly closed the door. I locked the door, realizing this trailer would never withstand whatever it was out there if it attacked. I locked the front door and turned on all the lights in the house. I grabbed all the bullets, the 30 odd six and the 22 rifle and then got in the kitchen with the dogs and I loaded each rifle, fully on. I hugged my dogs and I prayed that whatever it was went away and didn't attack. I stayed awake that whole night until my parents got back. My dad was furious that all the lights were on. My dad checked outside for supposed coyotes but whatever it was was gone and I could only hope it was gone for good. Story 7 July 2nd, 2015 While scanning the valley floor for sheep a mile from my house, I noticed two loping figures. Initially, I thought the figures were coyotes or maybe stray dogs, but as the two figures neared an old sunken vehicle, I realized that the things were about the size of the vehicle, nearly eight feet in length. Now, no animal could be that big on the reservation. I watched the two figures until they disappeared into the woods, across the valley. It was starting to get dark, but the moon was bright enough, so I walked without a light. As I walked down the mountain, I heard something yelling. It was like a howl or a yell. I started to hurry. Then, when I got to my house, I locked the door and spent the night listening to the strangest sounds I've ever heard. I'm sure it was a skinwalker or a werewolf or something. Story 8 Back in the early 80s, four of us decided to make a trip down to the Snake River, which was about five miles from the town we lived in. This was in eastern Oregon. Lots of sagebrush and hills. It was at the beginning of winter, so there was only a slight amount of snow on the ground. It was going to be a full moon that night, and we knew it would be a spectacular view of the river. Me, my husband, my sister, and her boyfriend were in our 68 Mustang, and we were so cool. We got some beer and had some weed, and we were just going to relax and enjoy the night. It was about 11 o'clock when we headed out. The place we were going to was a recreational area where people could camp, launch their boats, etc. To get into the place though, you have to leave the main road, dirt and gravel, dip down toward the boat docks that made a loop onto the upper portion of the parking lot. Everything was going well. The moon lit things up enough that you could make out shapes around you. We had just parked the car and were talking. My husband lit up a joint and then passed it to me. We were in the front seats, my sister and her boyfriend in the back. Just as I was getting ready to take my hit, I saw something move out in front of the car, maybe 20 yards out. My first thought was that maybe it was a deer. I was turning to pass the joint back and saw it moving to the right of the car. My sister knew something was up right away. She was about to ask what was wrong when she saw this thing moving toward the back of the car. Note that I had barely taken a hit. My sister didn't smoke or drink and no one else had time to do so. All of us were sober. We both said, what is that? The guys asked what and we said something is out there. They just started to laugh but then they saw it moving around the left of the car. At that point, I got the goosebumps all over my body and I had a very bad feeling about the whole situation. This thing moved around to the front of the car again 
but I noticed it was closer than before. At that point, I wanted to get out there and fast, and of course I was totally spooked, and the guys wanted to know what it was. This thing had circled the car once more, and when it got in front of it, again, my husband hit the headlights. Nothing. What the hell? It had been just right there a second before. When he hit the headlamp, it was on the right side of the car again, much closer than before. We just couldn't tell what it was. By this time, my sister, who was only 13, was freaking out, and so was I. We kept yelling for my husband to get us the fuck out of there. He must have been creeped out too because he started the car, slammed it into reverse, and spun out there backwards, heading for the loop so we can get back to the main road. We skidded around the loop, dropped down toward the boat docks, and began the slight climb up to the main road. We thought we were in the clear, but just then the scariest thing I had ever experienced up until that time in my life happened. As we began the climb out of the edge of the headlights, but in plain view, a creature appeared. It stood upright like a person, but was extremely skinny and covered in long, kind of silvery brown hair. It turned when the headlight hit it, and we were so close we could see some pretty good detail. This thing looked directly into my eyes, and I swear it was giving me a good once over, as if to memorize my face or something. Its eyes had dark pupils, and the look of them was like looking at a madman. Pure evil and insanity seemed to be the only thing in them. As soon as this happened, which couldn't have been more than just a few seconds, my husband hit the gas as was aiming right for it. He said later he was trying to hit it. It then moved so fast it was almost a blur and was gone. Why it even got caught in the headlights, I don't know. All I know is that we beat feet out of there as fast as we could. It was freezing outside and in the middle of nowhere. There was no homes, businesses, nothing. We couldn't figure out what we saw, but the only thing that came to mind was werewolf. Many creepy things happened in that area and I refuse to go there anymore. Story 9 Hi, my name is Kale, and this is a story of the first time that I saw a werewolf. It happened when I was a little boy, about 8 to 11 years old. I lived in Estonia, and I still do. Me with my stepfather, mother, older sister, and younger brother, and our dog, had went in the summer to our summer home. It was a beautiful old house that my parents had bought. We bought new windows to it because they didn't have any. So one night, me with my sister wanted to sleep in a tent. So our stepfather set the tent up and we spent the night in there. I was a little nervous because I had heard that the forest near our house has bears. But my mother said that bears don't come close to humans. And well, she was right. What I saw wasn't a bear. At around midnight when my sister was sleeping, I had to go to the bathroom. And so I got out and walked pretty far from the house to do my business. When I finished, I heard like a howl and screeching mixture. I looked around but didn't see anything. I thought it was in my head because I really like werewolves and wolves, but there were no wolves in our forest. Not that I would know, but I had asked my mother. I just felt like something or someone was staring at me, watching me. I started to walk back to the tent when I heard a scream that still haunts me. It was a scream of a deer, but it sounded like it was drowning. A few minutes I heard a rustle in the bushes. I looked toward the big bush near me which was roughly 50 feet towards me and saw an animal with red yellow glowing eyes that were looking directly at me. I thought it was a neighbor's dog but they lived a few miles away and the dog isn't so big than it was. So I was startled because my second thought was a bear and I didn't move because I knew when you meet a wild animal you can't turn your back to it so you had to walk away slowly backwards. But when I tried, I wounded my foot, and that thing growled at me so loudly. I couldn't walk away. I was afraid by knowing that it wasn't a bear. Bears don't growl like that. I stood there, this thing staring at me, and I started to smell a rotten stink mixture with blood. It growled again, with even more intensity. A few minutes had gone by, of which of course felt like hours. But then something happened, which I can only dream of. The thing stood on its back legs, and I saw what it looked like. Like I said, I was a big fan of werewolves, but I didn't think I would meet one. It was about 8 to 8.5 eight feet tall, with red yellowish eyes, covered in fur. Upper body had longer fur than the lower part, and it looked like a man. 
but it was bigger, and had a tail, and had a wolf or German shepherd's head. That thing stared at me for more minutes and came closer. It had black claws and brown fur, and it sniffed me really close like five feet away, and then stopped. It showed me its teeth by opening its mouth, and then I saw how its teeth were covered in blood. I think it saw how scared I was because I was crying. Then it turned around and walked toward the forest. But before it went in, it turned around and looked at me, like seeing if I was still watching. It howled and ran into the forest. When it was gone, I finally got my body to move and I walked to my tent. With my heart pounding in my chest, I finally got in and I could just feel the tears go down my face. I kept thinking about it and couldn't believe what I saw, so I tried to fall asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I wasn't sure if it was real or if I just had an intense dream. It felt so real and at night there was a full moon. When I checked my foot, I saw a wound that I got last night and I believed it was real. I haven't told anyone this story yet because I don't like it when people say that I make stuff up, like with my other stories, but I saw it for real. I'm now older and seeing the videos of true werewolf encounters, I believe I really did see a werewolf. I haven't seen any more of them of course, but who knows. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed this video and the last video of the Western United States Dogman Encounters. Be on the lookout for the East Coast Dogman Encounter series coming soon. Also, have you gotten a cool What Lurks Beneath coffee mug yet? Well, you should. Visit our Teespring store in the description below to snag yourself one. Oh, and if you like my channel, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you. Tonight, we're going to continue our Dogman Encounters of the Western United States. I know many of you are looking for it, and there's quite some eerie, hair-raising encounters. So get yourself ready. This is 10 Dogman Encounters of the Western United States, Part 2. Story 1. Lynn County, Oregon. March 2017. It was 2.30 a.m. and another night of not being able to sleep due to back pain. I was lying on my side reading when my very close by neighbor's motion detector lights turned on. This happened from time to time, and when it turns on, it lights up the entire side of my house. We have lived here for nine years and I have never once seen anything walk past my bedroom window at night. Since I was facing my large bedroom window, the very bright motion detector light going off caught my attention. I looked up and saw the side of a silhouette of a dog man. I said, holy crap! It was walking past my bedroom window. I saw it from mid shoulder up. The shoulders were huge and its head was humongous. It had pointed ears just like a German Shepherd dog and a very long snout. Its mouth was slightly open as I saw a large tongue that seemed to be lolling to the side of its mouth. When I saw this creature and spoke those words, I swear that thing slowed down, smirked, and then kept going. That's all I saw that night. Last week though, while in my bedroom again, I heard something huge land on the ground behind my bedroom wall. That wall has no windows. I heard deep, a really, really deep kind of raspy breathing. I just started praying, pleading the blood of Jesus over my house, grounds around it and all. I do this most nights, but sometimes I forget. I'm awake most nights until 3 a.m. or later due to having severe spinal issues, as well as fibromyalgia. We live in a lovely manufactured home community. There are lots of trees around here and it's very close to canals, large open fields, and a lot of woods. I know this is what I saw, but the fact that I saw it has left me amazed. Why is it that when so many are also seeing them? I guess I just thought since I am in the house most of the time, due to my health, I would never see them. The space between my neighbor's house and ours is about 10 feet. My husband went outside weeks later, once I got the courage to tell him this had happened, and measured the area by the window. That dogman had to be at least 8 feet tall. What concerns me greatly is that no one in the police department or government will alert people to their existence. People are walking around feeling a false sense of security. I know I did. 
I won't even try to walk outside anymore. And yes, I have cautioned my neighbors, the ones with the security light. I can't think of any other details right now, but it's important for you to know that several years ago, a homeless woman was camping out down by the river here in Albany. She was found dead and her tent was really torn up. I believe the police report in the newspaper said she was torn up as well, but I honestly can't remember any of the details to be specific. To the best of my knowledge, no one was ever caught for that crime. This is a sleepy town, just well over 50,000 people. We no longer get the newspaper, so I have no idea if this happened again. I do know that a couple was down by that same area and saw a dog man. It really frightened them badly. I heard about that on another YouTube channel. I just want people to be aware so they don't go out at night anymore, especially near the river. But then, we're not near a river and I saw one in the middle of the night. Thank you for reading this report and doing all that you do. Story 2. I Saw It in Oklahoma Back in the early 90s, when I was 19 or so, I worked nights unloading trucks at a chain retail department store, back before they turned all into superstores. Anyway, several people started to notice that a coworker looked like she wasn't getting any sleep. One night, she told us a few on our break that she was having to leave early and take the long way to work and back home because of something she had seen. She previously always took a road called Moccasin Trail, but one night, the week before, while turning onto that road on her way to work, she said she saw a huge werewolf sitting in the grass, just watching cars go by. She said she had seen it on four or five occasions and just couldn't take it anymore. She said she was scared this thing was going to follow her, so she just completely avoided that road altogether. The way she described the sighting was when she would turn onto this road, her headlights would light up the embankment across the road just enough so that she could see this big werewolf sitting about 30 feet up on the embankment. She said it would sit in the grass with its legs stretched out in front of itself. She said it would most often be leaning back, supporting itself on one or both of its elbows, in a kind of leisurely pose just watching the cars pass by. She really seemed to be sincerely disturbed by her encounter. Over the years, I have heard several stories about strange happenings in that area. The Native Americans talked about other shapeshifters in that area. I don't know if that has anything to do with that girl sighting or not. I just thought it was worth mentioning. Story 3. Predator in Oklahoma February 2016. I heard my dog barking and growling at around 3 a.m. one night. I got up and went to the back door to see what she was barking at. When I did, I saw her running up and down the backyard fence line, barking, growling, and urinating all over the fence with her tail tucked in. My first thought was, there was a predator nearby. I knew something was wrong. I focused my eyes to see if I could see what she was barking at and whispered, holy shit. I saw something bent over in a circle that was black and looked like it had a mane, like a lion. I looked at it for about 15 seconds and decided to run to the bedroom and get my head wrapped light. I put it on my head and ran to the back den and saw that it was still there. I carefully turned on the light and shined it right on it. When I did that, it turned around and looked right in my direction. Then it ran down the fence line with a smaller one in front of it. The best way I can describe it would be to say that it was the size of a lion. It had yellow eyes, pointed ears, huge shoulders, and a humongous chest. It ran on all fours. Also, this thing was so fast that it only took about two seconds to run down the entirety of the fence line. This wolf was way faster than my dog. I woke up my wife and told her what had just happened. I then went to the computer and googled huge wolves in America. Under images, I found a cartoon of a drawing someone had did, and its head and mane looked just like what I saw. It was called a Dogman. Story 4. It Happened in Cleveland June 2000. I had been up all night at a friend's house in the town of Tribby playing video games. I didn't want to sleep there, so I said goodbye and headed home. I knew my car was making a funny noise, but I thought surely I could get home. 
Well, I was driving down a long, dark stretch of highway with nothing but forest and a few sparse country houses. I was coming up to the top of a long hill when suddenly my car stops pulling forward. The engine revved, but no gears would engage. My CV joint just went out. I was hoping that wouldn't happen. Well, I had no way of getting it home, so I backed up down the road, in neutral and off onto a side road. I thought about staying and sleeping in the car, but something told me not to do that. I had an eerie feeling of being watched, so I grabbed my video game case and my machete that I had made from a lawnmower blade and started walking. I kept noticing the feeling of being watched, and it felt like I was being followed. I kept looking behind me and saw nothing. But when a car passed by, heading in the direction behind me, it illuminated the area with its headlights, and I saw something behind me, in the ditch, hunched down low. It was huge, and I could tell it looked animal, but had definite humanoid features. It seemed to have arms, but its head was mostly canine. Its head was very large, and its eyes glowed red when the lights hit them. Well, I've seen enough werewolf movies to know that this wasn't a good situation. So I started running. That probably wasn't the best choice, because I know that predators like to chase things that run from them. When the car had passed, the creature had darted into the trees. I thought that was the best time to run, so I did. I ran for about a quarter mile, and looked back but didn't see a thing, so I kept walking. Well, I kept checking behind me and off to the side where the tree line was. I knew it was still out there and probably following me, and yeah, I was afraid, but I was also prepared to defend myself with my machete if need be. I came up onto another hill and saw a farmhouse off in the distance to my left, down a long, dirt driveway. The moon was almost full, and the area around the house was clear, so I could see a guy out there messing with his trucks as I walked by. Then, he turned on a spotlight on his truck and spotted me with it. I kept walking because his property said no trespassing, and many out there wouldn't hesitate to unload on a strange trespasser. I knew it was close again, probably closer now, and I was about to turn around and face it when another car came over the top of the hill and passed me, going behind me again. I followed with my eyes and noticed this time it was a cop, so thinking quickly I dropped my machete on the edge of the grass and waved. As he passed, his lights hit the ditch as well, and I saw the dogman was very close, but it darted into the trees yet again. Thankfully, a moment later the cop stopped and turned around. He came back and asked me what I was doing out there, so I told him what happened with my car. I didn't mention the dogman though. He may have thought I was crazy, but I asked him for a ride home. He agreed after wanting to go check and make sure my car wasn't blocking the road. After we checked it, he agreed to take me home. I don't know what might have happened that night if he hadn't shown up, and it was the only time I was genuinely happy to see a police officer. Story 5. Dogmen in Kansas Early 2000s. If you know anything about Kansas, you'll know it's dry, flat, and void of much forestry. As a kid, I lived on a farm in the middle of nowhere. I remember that we had our own place set outside complete with swings and monkey bars. Nearby was a large patch of overgrown weeds, almost as tall as six feet in some places. I hated playing at the playset, because sometimes, around sunset, I'd see red eyes from within the weed patch. I told my grandparents, but they dismissed it as coyotes. However, one day, I wanted answers and I approached the weeds. Upon closer inspection, I saw a creature that looked similar to a dog with shaggy white fur. I remember that I thought its front paws looked like that of a gorilla's. The creature moved away from me and I never saw it in that weed patch again. A year later, I saw the same figure lurking in the dark outside of the house. I was so paranoid my mother could not get me to leave the house for a long time, except for only going to school. I haven't seen this humanoid since, nor am I completely sure if it's the fabled Dogman. Story 6. It Appeared in the Night Summer of 2016. I was driving home doing some shopping in a nearby town and was all alone just driving and listening to the radio. It was just before sunset on a beautiful summer day. I was admiring the sky because it was such a bright orange. 
While driving through some S-curves in the road, I made the first turn and saw some deer dart across the road. Immediately, I hit the brakes to slow down, not knowing if there were more to come out of the woods. On the opposite side of the road, it drops down a steep embankment to a farm field. I had slowed the car down and scanned the tree line for more deer, and that's when this thing jumped out of the woods running after the deer. He landed in the middle of the road and cleared the rest of the road in his next stride alone. It's so hard to comprehend what I saw, but it sounds like the descriptions that people have claimed. It was a gray figure with a short, sleek coat. I did not see a tail on this creature. It was on all fours and was the same height as a deer. His head, though, was very odd. It looked like a dog head with cropped pointed ears but had a very short muzzle. He briefly turned his head towards me when he crossed, and his eyes, I wouldn't say they glowed, but they weren't normal animal eyes. They were like a dull yellow, and they definitely stood out. His body was what really confused me, because the way it moved was like a human would when trying to run on all fours. Its gait looked lazy, like he was just kind of loping across the road. It was very muscular on the front end, but had a very thin almost sickly looking abdominal area and hind legs. Once he was across the road, I lost sight of him over the embankment. I was so confused as to what I saw that I didn't tell anyone right away for fear that they would think I was crazy. I had been searching for answers since then but came up with nothing. I eventually told my husband and one close friend but neither of them had heard anything that matched my description. I'm still not 100% sure that I saw a dogman but it's the only thing I have come across that sounds reasonably close to what I had seen. Story 7 The Beast of Jackson County September 13th, 2013 Before I say anything about my encounter, I'd been studying wolves and their behavior for about three years before I had this encounter. And I know that considering Jackson County is about 656 square miles with a population of roughly 675,000 and it being practically infested with wildlife such as deer, livestock, and predators such as coyotes and foxes, it wouldn't be likely for a large predator such as a wolf to be lurking in the sparse woodlands. The average wolf territory is 13 to 2400 square miles, and it'd be easy for such a huge creature to just live in the Jackson County alone. This may even be the very same dog-wolf-man thing that other people had seen. Anyway, on to the encounter. I was just chilling on the laptop in the living room, watching people blow stuff up, when I felt like I had to go to the bathroom. I set the laptop down and put my headphones on the keyboard and got out of the chair. Let me clarify, I'm not a bloody psychic or a medium or anything, but I have a sort of sixth sense where I can tell if something is watching me, and I knew something was. We have a huge window on the wall just above the couch, and it was a particularly cold night, so the windows caught things like breath fairly well. I turned to the window, thinking that whatever it was watching me from there, and I knew I'd see it if it was, and it'd have to be either standing on something or tall as the devil himself in order to see into the window of our trailer, since it was around 8 feet off the ground, with the top of it being about 11 feet. I looked over to see the window, and the only thing I could see was the floodlights were on, and something seemed to duck under the window, like a kid playing hide and seek. I didn't think anything of it, considering our neighbors were sort of druggies and alcoholics and often came to look in our windows, and every opening to the house was also locked, so I had nothing to worry about. I went to the bathroom, and when I finished I washed my hands and went back to the laptop. I noticed that the floodlights went out, so whatever it was was gone. Not thinking anything else of it, I went back to watching people blow stuff up on YouTube. I should mention also that my eyes are sharp sharp enough to spot a bird at about 50 feet away in a tree, so it's no surprise that when the floodlights came back on, I noticed immediately. I glanced up from the screen, expecting a drunken or high idiot to be looking in with a stupid expression on his face, but I was frozen by what I saw. It was a huge, huge wolf 
that was looking at me with dirty, ambery yellow eyes. Its ears looked like they were torn or cropped or something, and the face looked sort of human-like. Not really a full human face, but more like the jawline looked very masculine and human compared to the rest of its face. Its lips were curled back, and it seemed as if it were snarling, though I couldn't hear if it was, and its breath caught on the cold glass. It was so tall that the top of its head was halfway up the window, and if I had to guess how wide it was, I'd probably say maybe the width of my shoulders. I knew that whatever it was, it was most likely had to have wolfish instincts, so I did the only thing I knew to do, which was avoid eye contact and make yourself look as small as you could whilst having your throat and underside showing. This is a very common submissive position, and although I was scared out of my mind, I knew that holding eye contact would make me seem like a challenger, and running would make me seem like prey. When I did the submissive position, it must have worked for it to leave me alone because it just hit the window, which made the entire trailer shake, and it went away. I hadn't heard or seen anything else since, though I do hear the odd howl coming from the back roads. God help the poor idiot that decides to try and hunt this thing down. I can tell you now that whatever it was was not friendly, because if it were, it wouldn't have slammed my window as hard as it had and it would not have been growling like I'd taken its food. Although it practically did assault my window, I could understand why it was upset. I was on its territory, after all, an intruder and possibly a threat to its existence and its prey. It's really just best to stay out of its way and respect it. After all, it is one of God's many strange creatures in this world. Story 8 Stay Out of the Woods June 6, 2015 Since it was summer break for my school, I was lazily lounging at home watching TV. I got bored, so I went outside to see if I could do anything with my chickens, like feed them worms and snails. Before I go into more detail, I should explain the area I live in. My home is on the outskirts of the city I live in. I had about five or seven chickens at the time, and we hadn't expanded the coop, so it was a small pen connecting to two sides of the chicken coop, which is wooden and sturdy. The only ways to get into the coop is either through the trap door, attached to the big door, and the three windows. One window is on one side of the door, and the second window is on the other side. The third window is a large window. Keep in mind that they all have traps connected to them so they can be closed. We have seven acres of woodland that we call the back pasture, and if you've ever been back there, you could see that it's a popular habitat for the local deer. There was also a wild boar that was roaming around at the time, and I don't know how it got there. We had been having trouble with poachers for quite a while, considering the population of deer in the woods. One poacher had set up a trail cam, one that was motion activated. There was an old rusty deer stand that had been put on a tree a long time ago, and the tree had begun to grow around it. Beyond our acres of woods, there's a large cornfield owned by our neighbors, and beyond that is a forest. I don't know what the forest is like beyond the field since we've never been there. I went outside to do something with my chickens, and I had brought along a bucket of corn for feeding the deer after. When I walked out of my home, I saw a doe was sitting in the tall grass. I thought it was sleeping since its head had been down and wasn't moving. I, being the curious little nut I was, decided that I would sneak up on the deer and get a picture of it to show my mother when she got home from work. I crept as silently as I could across the yard that separated me from the deer. I should also mention that we have a clearing with a burn pit in it that was filled with cedar branches. I was creeping across my yard towards the deer, and when I had cleared the burn pit and was about 10 yards from it, I realized that the deer wasn't asleep, but it was dead. It was the most disgusting sight I'd ever seen. Its intestines were completely gone, the flesh on the body of the doe shredded to pieces, and blood absolutely everywhere. It looked as if it had been sitting there for a while, and it smelt like it too. Most of the blood was dried and the air reeked with the stench of rotting flesh, urine, and what seemed to be like a hint of wet dog. Something that creeped me out about the scene was, although it was a rotting carcass, there were no insects at all around it. 
It was as if the usual lively forest was deader than the deer. Not even the neighbor's cattle made a sound. It looked as if the poor deer had simply been left after being brutally attacked and half-eaten, which it most likely was. I left the bucket at the beginning of the trail, thinking that I would come out later with my mother and grain the deer when she got home. Then, I started to walk back to the house. I had barely taken a few steps when I heard a low, snarling growl that sounded like a wolf. Although it seemed distorted as if it were being played on an old radio, Against my better judgment, I turned my head around and I saw what looked like the biggest freaking werewolf you'd ever seen. It was on all fours. Its fur was black and matted in places. Its face was what you'd expect a wolf to look like, although it was broad and the muzzle seemed a little short. Although the way it was curling its lips made it look as if its snout was plenty long and its eyes were yellow. Not a bright yellow like the yellow of a flower or the sun, but a dim, amber, dark red-yellow, if that makes sense. Its ears looked like that of a Doberman pincer, with a cropped effect. Its front legs were long, and it looked as if it were a bodybuilder. Its paws, if you can even call them paws, looked like huge hands with long claws at the end of them. It stood up, and I heard the most sickening popping sound you could ever imagine. It sounded like the sound of popping joints, but it seemed amplified as if it were being played through a microphone and the sound was coming out of a loudspeaker. Its body looked like a bodybuilder's pumped up on steroids. It was so big. It had no tail that I could tell and it seemed to tower over me. Although I was a good 10 meters from it, I was about five foot four inches at the time and I came nowhere close to its height. It was so tall that the tip of its ears could almost touch the top of a young cedar it let out a loud howl, which sounded more like a roar, and it charged me. Doing the only thing I knew to do while hyped upon fear and adrenaline, I began to run away from it. I remember clearing my yard in what seemed like hours, but was most likely only a few seconds, and running inside, slamming and locking all the doors and windows. As I calmed down a small bit, I had realized that if it had really wanted to kill me, that it would have. That what I had experienced was not an attack charge, but a bluff. I was lucky to get away with my life. Although this happened almost two years ago, it still terrifies me to think about it. The deer was gone the next day, and ever since that evening I have been weary around the woods, only going in them in broad daylight, only when I absolutely had to and never without a weapon. Sadly, I cannot say that I am one of those people that have stopped experiencing things after the encounter although I only had nightmares for a month after that day in June. Nothing really started to happen again until about two months ago when I was staying up at night playing on the laptop. I had started to hear things moving around on the porch and turned on the light to see the shape of something huge disappearing behind the corner of my house. There was also one of the rare times I went to the woods after the first encounter when I was helping my mother clear brush from the hunting clearing. I was going to get the mower and was walking the trail to do so when I heard bipedal footsteps following me off to my side. They stopped whenever I stopped and I eventually ran out of the woods and I haven't been back since. I asked my late grandmother about the creature I had seen in the woods and she informed me that there was something called the Wolfhead Man that stalked the Kansas tribe, preying on small children that strayed too far from their teepees. Later, I was informed by my history teacher that my house had actually been built on a tribal burial ground, and I have since been wondering that if that had anything to do with it. I hadn't heard about the Wolfhead Man before she had told me about it. When I saw that there were several eyewitness reports that were proved to be truthful, it made me feel a lot better about coming out with this information. I had an attempt to tell people previous to this submission, but everyone either said I was stupid crazy or just a plain lying. One thing's for certain, I am not stupid, I am not crazy, and I am most definitely not a liar. I know what I saw, and what I saw was a dog man. Story 9, Dogman, Not Bigfoot 2013, I wasn't there, but my son, son-in-law, and their friends saw a dog man. My son called me all freaked out that they had seen a Bigfoot because he knows I believe in Bigfoots. Now, my son always made fun of me for believing in Bigfoots. He asked me, Dad, 
can Bigfoots run on all fours? I said, yes, why do you ask? And he said, dad, we just saw one out spotlighting rabbits. I asked him to describe what it looked like, and he said they were hunting rabbits with a spotlight, and he saw something hunched over. He said he then yelled to the others and let them know that he had seen something, and then started to shine his light on it. At first, he thought it was a large bird because it was down like it was eating something. Then, it stood up on its hind legs and spread its arms out wide, and then when the other two came to look at it, it dropped down and took off faster than anything they had ever seen before. He said it had a dog's snout and was covered in fur, but you could see it was very muscular. Now, my son is 6'2", and he felt it stood as tall or taller than him. When it took off, they ran after it and watched it jump and clear a huge rock pile in one leap, like nothing. That scared them, and they all ran back to their car to get out of there. I spoke to all three, and they had the same story and described it the same way. I told my son that that's not a Bigfoot, because Bigfoots don't have dog snouts. I told him, you saw a dog man. It's funny that this happened around a lot of cornfields. The area also had caves and was covered in sagebrush. Story 10. I saw it in Idaho Falls. My name is Angela. I am a 47 year old female from Idaho Falls, Idaho. I grew up in Idaho and I am an avid animal lover, especially wolves since I was very young. I am writing to tell you about my dogman encounter when I was around 16 or 17 years old. This would have been right around 1986 or 1987. Anyway, myself, my friend, and my other friend decided one night to go into our local cemetery and look for what is called the Knocking Grave and the Werewolf Grave. We found the Knocking Grave and discovered that it is just a loose board which vibrates back when you knock on the grave. We never found the Werewolf Grave, so we just chalked it up as being a myth. We decided to go back to the car and we were talking when my friends A and B decided they wanted some alone time. They were a couple at the time. I got out of the car and decided to walk around the cemetery by myself. It was a beautiful night with a full moon shining above, ironic I know. I was walking along looking at the old gravestones and thinking of how sad it is that so many people are completely forgotten after they die when I heard a strange sound to my left. I was standing near a mausoleum looking down into another part of the cemetery. I heard the sound again and started walking towards it. It sounded as though something was crunching on something. I stood there for a minute listening. I immediately noticed how quiet it had gotten in the cemetery and the hair stood up on my neck and arms. Usually there is noise from cars or dogs barking or crickets or something like that but there was nothing. I then saw a silhouette of something big and black standing a little ways away from me around 25 feet away to be exact. Something told me to back away slowly and leave now, but I ignored it. I crept closer to the creature, never taking my eyes off of it. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness and I could see very well, especially with the moonlight helping light up the night. What I saw terrified me and also piqued my curiosity. The creature first looked like a huge wolf but the front legs and torso were abnormally large and the back legs were huge as well. It had a long furry tail behind it just like a wolf's tail. The head was huge and it had long pointed ears with stuffs of fur at the tips. From what I could see, it was leaning down and was eating something. The sounds I had heard was the crunching it made when it bit into whatever it was eating. I was excited because I had always wanted to see a wild wolf and I thought that was what I was looking at. I figured that maybe a wolf had escaped the zoo, which was right next door to the cemetery and had caught a rabbit or something. I realized though that the zoo didn't have a wolf in it and hadn't had one for years. That made me even more excited and curious. I stared at this creature for about a minute or so, and then I shifted my legs to get more comfortable, and I must have stepped on a twig or scuffled my feet because the creature suddenly stopped eating looked up and turned its head my way. It then stood up on its back legs and I heard a loud pop and that is when I realized that this was not a huge wolf. It was black and had a few brownish streaks in its fur. 
When it stood up, I saw its head, chest, stomach, and lower body. The shoulders and chest were massive and covered in fur that tapered down as you looked at the stomach area and legs. It reminded me of a bodybuilder on steroids because of how muscular it was. As it stood there, it started to sniff the air and it stopped and stared my way. The eyes were a deep orange gold and seemed to glow in the moonlight. It looked at me and I felt a fear grow deep within me that I had never felt before. I knew it saw me and I knew I had made a huge mistake by not leaving when I first got that bad feeling. It felt as though everything went cold and this creature could see within my soul. It stared at me for a minute and then it opened its mouth and it bared its teeth at me as if it were smiling. The teeth were huge and yellowish white and they looked very sharp, just right for ripping its prey apart. It never took its eyes off of me. It then lifted its arm and took a bite out of whatever it was eating. I then realized the sound I had heard was it crunching bone and tearing flesh as it ate its meal. The hands were like elongated paws and at the end of each finger were huge black claws that gripped the leg it was eating. I stood there watching it eat for what seemed like hours when it could have only been a few moments. He never took his eyes off me. The fear I felt overwhelmed me. I felt sick and I was visibly shaking. And so I did the one thing I had been taught to never do when confronted with a predator. I turned and I ran as fast as I could back to that car. I didn't care. I couldn't get his eyes out of my head. And that smile. Those teeth. I could just imagine it catching me and ripping me to shreds as I ran. I made it to the car though flung open the door and jumped in screaming for both of my friends to start the car and get us the hell out of there. They asked me what was wrong and I just yelled at them to go, now. They both looked at me and saw the terrified look on my face, so they started up the car and we left and I never went back to that cemetery again. Later that night, I told both of my friends what I had seen and they both just laughed at me and told me it was just my mind playing tricks on me which made me feel hurt that they didn't believe me, but I could hardly believe it myself. I saw a werewolf, or what is referred to as a dogman, and I will never forget it. Please, if you're listening to this, don't ever traverse through the Idaho Falls Cemetery. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoy my content, be sure to subscribe for more true and scary encounters with Dogman, Bigfoot, and all other sorts of creepy, hairy creatures and cryptids, and more. Don't forget to snag yourself a shirt or a really cool coffee mug from our Teespring online store. Stay tuned, we have all sorts of cool new videos coming your way. Dogman. Werewolves. They're being spotted all over the country, in forests, in cities, in rural areas and towns. There have been reports of them killing livestock and terrifying witnesses. Many reports seeing a giant black wolf that stands up on its hind legs with glowing amber eyes and is extremely aggressive. Some claim they are demons and of the supernatural, while others claim they are beasts of the wilderness and not to be trifled with. Tonight, we are going to be looking at 10 different dogman encounters all across the western United States. If you have an encounter you would like to share with me, or have read on the show, you could leave it in a comment below, or simply send me an email from the email address listed in the description. You can also find a couple shirts and a really cool coffee mug from Teespring listed in the description below. Our merch line will be continuing to expand. Now, let's let the stories begin. Story 1. Dogman on my property. A few years ago, I decided to contact the BFRO about yetis on my place. I call them yetis because they have three toes instead of five. I always knew we had more than one cryptid on the place. I live on a river and have about 18 acres or so of land. The dogman has been sighted off Lime Road which also borders my river. I am from Pueblo, Colorado and live on St. Charles River which dumps into the Arkansas River. 
my researchers had me put out cams to see if I could catch any Bigfoot activity. I did, and over the years have caught other strange creatures on camera. I call them hybrids. My encounter started when I was 8 years old in 1969 when a huge Bigfoot stood up in front of my dad's tractor, and it has continued to this day with other creatures as well. I have a pic of dogmen I caught in the river. It takes up a span of four feet wide. He has huge shoulders and is staring directly at the camera across from it. Yes, it is black, has ears that tip in towards themselves and scars on its face, and it appears he is not too happy about having his picture taken. I felt very vindicated when I got that picture, and I blew it up in words so I can get a good look at the creature. Quite ugly to say the least. It is a daylight picture, right about when the sun is setting. Good picture anyway. In the picture he is not standing, but buffed out squatting, looking at the camera. And that's not all. I keep my big dogs in at night because I don't want them killed. I have an older blue healer and an Irish wolfhound mix. He's not as big as an Irish wolfhound, but nonetheless is fast and aggressive. I almost lost him last fall, and he was three at the time. I came home, and he wasn't there to greet me. I found him pretty beat up with a six-inch slice at his groin, which almost cut into his phenol artery. He had no bite marks at all, but he was beat all over his body like something pulverized him. He was so swollen that you could push in on the swelling like you were pushing in on a semi-inflated balloon. I called my pastor neighbor, who indeed said there was a fight in the river at about 9 a.m. She said it sounded horrible and heard a dog screaming. Well, I said it was my dog. It changed my dog's personality. He is more cautious, and when these creatures are around, he will not leave my side, nor will he venture to the river. Irish wolfhounds are ear, sight, and smell dogs. When he stands on his hind legs or raises his head smelling the air and turns around and comes back to me, something is afoot in the river. I have had many instances with these creatures on my place, and I have lost a few good dogs to that river and what runs it. Story 2. It Chased My Vehicle Eight years ago, my brother John was heading home from his girlfriend's house off a county road outside of Boulder, 11 miles south of Pinedale, Wyoming. It was around 1 or 2 a.m. when he saw what he said was a huge dog traverse down the slope on the south side of the road and commence to run along the side of his pickup. He was driving a 6970 Ford F-150 high boy, which came from the factory lifted. The dogman was running with him at 35 to 40 miles per hour. There is a two to three foot barrow ditch running along the road and the dogman's head was level with his as he was driving. So John puts his height at roughly seven to eight feet tall. It was dark in color with gray or white on its muzzle running from its nose to under its eyes which were amber in color. He sped up to 45 and the dogman kept up with him often looking inside the pickup. He said that around 50 miles an hour, he lost it, and that's all he would tell me. Story 3. Dogman in Snohomish The year was 1997 to 1998. My first encounter happened late at night, while driving home to Snohomish from Sultan, the two towns being about 10 miles apart. I was with my mother and we had just finished dropping off a friend at her home in Sultan. It was late October and there was an unusual storm going on that night that everybody talked about the following day. Tremendous cloud to cloud lightning and a very cold dry wind with no rain. Bright flashes of light, loud thunder and lots of leaves blowing around. After dropping our friend off we were on a stretch of the road that's very dark with farmland on either side of Highway 2, and both sides having densely wooded hills. We were driving a 1991 Honda Accord, and at this one particular spot in the road, something caught my eye, 
off to the left side, which was a farm field, and there was a break in the guardrail for a dirt road going into the field. Right when we were even to this break, I saw what looked like a huge dog coming up, and right then, it ran in front of our car, and I hit it. We could see the top of its back, which we both swear looked more like a hyena at this point than a dog. It had to be huge to see its back over the hood of the car, when you're sitting pretty low to the ground in a Honda Accord. Its fur was shaggy brown and molted with dark spots, just like a hyena, and its front seemed higher up than its back. The headlights lit it up as it ran in front of our car, and we could feel it get hit, but didn't see it go either up in the air or off to the right side of the car. It was running from left side of the highway to the right. We were driving westward. It sent my car into an uncontrollable swerve back and forth into the oncoming lane, and I just prayed that I could get it under control to keep from getting into a head-on collision with what looked like maybe a Ford Aerostar van. A calmness came over me and I felt my guardian angel had taken control of the steering, because we had missed the van by just a few inches. After going a little ways further, we were both so shook up that I pulled off to the side. My mother wanted to go look for the dog because we both love animals and felt bad about hitting something, but uh, I had a bad feeling and looking for this dog because it had looked so strange, I was afraid of it. It was dark and stormy. It didn't feel safe, and I just wanted to get home. We got back in the car and stopped at a little gas station. When we first got into Monroe, which is the next town between our town and Sultan, we got out to look at the front of my car, thinking surely there would be some evidence of hitting something that large. We were going the highway speed, which is about 60 miles an hour. Like a dent, some fur of blood, but there was nothing there not a scratch. The whole thing had a very supernatural feel to it. The look of this dog, which was huge and looked more like a hyena, just didn't seem right. Neither did the timing of it running in front of us, like it wanted to make a stop on that dark stretch of road and get out of my car, which we did, but we got right back in. I never saw it on two legs. It ran on all fours, but there was something so calculated about the way it came up to the highway and looked at our car and ran in front of it. It seemed planned. It was such a strange electromagnetic type of storm that night too. The next day, people we knew that lived miles and miles apart in many different directions all talked about the storm and one particularly loud thunderclap that shook everyone's homes. They all thought it was directly over their house, but they were all miles apart. I have three more encounters which occurred after this one, and I'm pretty sure this happened October 1997, and no later than 1998. Story 4, Roscoe County, Texas The first encounter happened when I was young and trying to fall asleep. I looked out the window and saw it. Out towards the backyard faced my window at the time. Nowadays, I sleep in the basement, back on topic though. My brother and I always felt nervous looking out that window. My bed perfectly faced the window at the time. The beast was three feet away looking into it. It had yellow eyes, a long snout of a dog, black fur. Its face is kinda human, subtract the snout and the gnarly long teeth, and fur all over its face. Once it realized I noticed it, it snarled at me quietly through the window, and it was a stare down. I slowly pulled the covers over my head. I then proceeded to cry for what felt like forever. Then I ran into my parents' room crying, telling me it was just a dream. I thought that for what was like eight years until my sophomore year in high school when my brother, my friend, and I were out fishing. My brother loved peanut butter at the time and he brought a plate with a giant serving size spoon glob and some rich crackers. There's a creek back there, surprisingly some decent fish, mostly chub, but there is bullhead, carp, green-bellied sunfish, crayfish, snapping turtles brown trout, 
And I think that's really it. We sometimes thought it would be funny to throw the chub there and leave them there at our favorite spot. A giant fallen oak tree which acts like a natural bridge across the creek it fell, due to the amount of weight it was bearing. My friend and I went downstream one summer's day. Meanwhile, my brother was fishing alone. He went to go take a leak, and he left the food on the other side of the creek. When he came back, he saw it running off with what he described as more of a Bigfoot. He ran to us hysterical. We just thought he was crazy, so he started calling him Crazy Joey. After that, I thought of my own run-in with something strange. Later, my friend was busy with lawn work and prepping to move. I was secretly afraid to go out. Joe decided to come back there a month later, and he left by himself. I wish I could have saw him to confirm my story. But the second time around, I believed him for sure. He was catching some fish. His line was all screwed up, and so he took it off his fishing rod and re-spooled it. He had claimed that he had to chase off the same thing that took the food previously. I've seen something else very similar to my own sighting. My brother, my friend, and some others were going to fish at an illegal spot we didn't know it was illegal, and it turned out to be private property at the time. Whenever me and my friends try out new spots, we have tradition of casting base lures first, and then use normal live bait. I wanted to hesitate because the fish were biting pretty good at the creek, so sure enough they went ahead of me across the oak towards the quarry. I felt alone after 12 minutes, and then I took my bag, two poles, and tackle, and I was changed out close to the log. I started walking and saw what I thought to be a big gray wolf. It made eye contact with me and we had another stare down. After a little while I chased it off into the prairie. Story 5 Freestone County, Texas I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes as usual, this time of year. It was April. I was hiking through my next door neighbor's land to get to the wood covered land at the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tint on my headlamp to my spotlight, but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 AM and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather and we both went out to where I had seen this creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it and it was roughly seven and a half to eight feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours. Never again. Story 6. Howls in the Canyon after attending a matter in Austin during the day, I decided to camp out near a local state park and a private ranch that I won't name. The lady there was really nice and I don't wish her any bad business. It was after dark, about 6.30pm last Friday, November 18th, 2016, when I was invited to explore and set up camp anywhere on the property. I went to the most isolated part in the very back, near a creek. Once in the area, I heard screams made by people, approximately two males and one or two females. At first, I thought to myself, damn, I'm going to have to hear these drunks yell all night as they blast off their primal scream therapy routine. They had set a campfire below next to the creek. I was about 150 yards away, high up near the ledge. The creek ran about 10 yards below me, and I caught a glimpse of their fire, but not of the people. Only quick shadows darted past the flames. 
It was odd, but I did not think much of it at the time. I proceeded to return to my area where I'd parked my car and gather firewood. I ignored the screams that these folks were making. Yet, I noticed that I never once heard talking or voices commenting normal language. Just screams that kept getting more intense and strong and longer in duration. Still, I did not think of it as being too weird. I kept about my business, trying to set up my camp and my tent in the dark. After struggling, flashlight in my mouth, and knees scraped from laying out the bedding in the tent, I walked around enjoying the open view of the sky. By now, the screams had turned to barking and howling. Earlier during my wood gathering forage, I heard someone walking in the darkness, and I assumed it to be a female person who probably had strayed from the perimeter to go get to the bathroom. I spoke to the person in the dark mentioning that I would be setting up camp in this upper area away from them. The person never answered, so I felt confident I had established a respectful territorial mark where I would not go near them, and they, in turn, would not come close to me. Nevertheless, I still did not think anything was weird up to that point. What began to worry me was when about an hour later, as I was about to begin my fire and rest in my tent, three or four howls united into a very loud crescendo. That got my attention. The barking now was more intense and deeper. At first, I thought that maybe these people were using dogs to fight each other, but it was not like that. In dog fights, you can listen to the dogs tearing into each other and the voices of the men cheering on. Here, the barking seemed to be going on in one direction, as if the dogs or coyotes were competing to outdo each other with barks, wailing and howling. As my mind tried to comprehend what was going on, another possible scenario appeared to my reasoning capability. Maybe they had set up speakers and were playing a recording of barks and howls, but it made no sense. Once again, the barking deepened and the howling became more fierce and louder. That's when I decided that I would not be able to sleep there at all. Besides, the sounds did not appear to be human-based from what I could tell. I collapsed the tent I had struggled to set up for almost an hour and left the stone ring and all the firewood of different lengths and thicknesses stacked and ready. A sense of self-preservation came over me as I was alone, unarmed except for a long, heavy machete I gripped with my right hand. Before leaving, I crept as far as I could to the ledge where earlier I had seen their campfire, but the barking and howling was too great. I crept up quietly in the defensive combat mode only 25 yards further. How I wished to have my tape recorder box with batteries so that my wife could hear what I was hearing. Like I said, I could not go any deeper or closer to them because the things voicing out the barking and howls were not people. I never saw them, and I don't think I ever do. Story 7 it attacked my neighbor's dog. On April 4th of 2018, I came back from work around midnight. Like most nights, I sat down on my back porch and lit a cigarette and relaxed. However, unlike most nights, I heard something new. I am used to coyotes and my neighbor's dogs barking. But in this case, I heard something new. It sounded like a deep howl. But instead of the usual dog sound, it stayed as one tone, and it was octaves deeper. I heard it go from backyard to backyard, and the neighbor's dogs took notice. The dog's barking triggered one of my dogs to run out to the fence line, and she began to bark at something unseen. I got up and told her, Hey, come back in, girl. It's okay. She turned to me, and she sat there, utterly frozen in fear, it took a few moments to break her out of this, and she bolted to the back door. I decided to poke my head out of the gate and look into the field behind the fence. By the tree line, I saw these amber-colored eyes standing about five feet above the ground. I decided to run in and took up my knife and ran out in the direction of the eyes. The whole time I walked, I heard the howls. However, when I got close to where I initially saw these eyes... Every sound stops. 
You could literally hear a pin drop. Where I didn't see anything, I felt the presence of something watching me. Some sort of alpha predator that I didn't know about. After a few moments, I walked back to the porch and sat and had another smoke. It was then that the house started again. This time, though, they came from my neighbor's backyard. They have two shepherds, and I will never forget this sound. I first heard this guttural growl noise unlike anything I've heard before. Then one of the shepherds shrieked, and then I heard the other get slammed against the fence. One thing led to another, and I heard my neighbor fire off a round, and then I heard this thing trail off. The next encounter was just three nights ago. I heard the house start up again. But this time, I heard it making its way through the tree line behind the back lot of my house. I heard the thumping of its feet, and branches were snapping. My instincts kicked in to get cover, so I shut off the back porch light and allowed my eyes to get adjusted. There was enough light to clearly see the opening in the tree line. That's about two of me wide, and about nine plus feet tall. I watched in the direction where the noises were coming from, and all of a sudden, I see it stand up. I first saw the ears, tall and sharp like knives. I then saw its head, followed by its broad shoulders and long arms. It stood there watching me for what seemed like forever until it turned and ducked down a little and took massive strides on two legs to walk off. It's because of this I've been conducting an investigation on this thing. I learned there was an encounter in Firestone County not very far from me. I hope to get reasonable evidence to show you all soon. Story 8. We Saw It in the Window April 1999. For some background info, I was raised in the deserts, southeast of New Mexico, on two different ranches so I am very well versed in the flora and fauna of our beautiful state. I have been used to track semi-professionally for hunters and our local trappers. I know the critters around this state. We always lived on a very remote ranch, 50, sometimes 75 miles from the nearest actual town. My senior year of high school, I moved out of my own, being a part of the DECA program, to live closer to my job and school. This is where my story starts in April of 99. My boyfriend and I were rooming with a couple in a trailer house just outside of Lakewood, New Mexico. We rented a room from them and sometimes watched their two kids as part of our rental agreement. For a few weeks that April, a lot of the neighboring landowners had been complaining about wild dogs coming up from the river and harassing their dogs and scaring their livestock. One guy had even reported some structural damage to one of his chicken coops. The couple we lived with had two dogs, both of them medium-sized terrier mixes, and neither one of them were of the cowardly side. They had been getting very skittish about going outside at night, though. So much so that we had to make sure to let them out right at sunset, and again at sunrise, because they would not leave the trailer house otherwise at night. One Saturday night, at about 11 p.m., Near the end of the month, the four of us were sitting around, watching TV and just basically talking about stuff, when the dogs started growling and barking at the window on the south wall of the bedroom. This was really unusual behavior for them, so we all got up to see what they were on about. By the time we got there, the dogs had shifted their barking away from the window and seemed to be barking at the wall and along the wall, like they could smell something there but it was moving. It was very strange. And when they came up to the end of the room, their barking just went crazy. Suddenly, from farther down the wall, at the same time, we all heard this loud thump and scuffling sound. It was powerful enough that we actually felt it. The dogs at this point just completely lost it. They cried out a high-pitched whine and just dove under the bed. We all ran out of the bedroom, down the hall, and into the kitchen to see what the hell was up. Peering out of the kitchen window was pointless, as it was late. There was cloud covering, and the moon wasn't even out. We heard the scuffling noise again from further down the house, and went into the living room to see what was up. 
We were all really confused at this point. The next few moments seemed to happen in slow motion. Appearing in the living room window from left and looking right in on us from the glass was... I don't know what. From the shoulders up, what I can only describe as a man-dog. Its shoulders were quite human, with short, sleek hair, but it had the head of what looked to be a Rottweiler. And the teeth, oh my god, the teeth on this thing. All four of us screamed at about the same time, and I guess that scared it off, because it just disappeared. That image is forever seared into my head. Also of this note, this was a trailer house, so the bottom of that window was easily six feet off the ground meaning this thing was seven foot something. No matter how big of a dog or wolf it was, it could not have stood up and looked at us like that in the window. The guys immediately grabbed their shotguns and headed out the door, even though I told them it was a bad idea. I guess they were out there looking for it for some 20 minutes before they came back inside and said they couldn't see anything. The light from the house shining in on it being so close to the window were the only reasons we saw it in the first place. None of us really slept well that night. It just felt creepy. The next morning, I got up early and decided to go have a look around the house to see if there were any tracks to identify what the hell it was. The grass and weeds that were right beside the house pretty much hid any tracks it made there, although I did find where it looked as if something had clawed at the siding along the bottom of the house in a couple of places, making the thump and scuffling sounds the night before. I then decided to follow the tracks the guys had made, and that was when I made a second, very unnerving discovery. The guys made clear tracks in the sandy dirt, and whatever it was out there did as well, because it was pretty much circling them the entire time they were out there, at a distance of about 40 feet. The tracks were huge canine and switched back and forth from four tracks to two, meaning it was walking bipedally for at least half the time it circled them. Just freaking creepy. Story 9. The Werewolf of Mineral County, Nevada I grew up in a town called Hawthorne, located in Nevada. Hawthorne is located right next to Walker Lake. The main highway leading from Hawthorne to Reno is Highway 95, which, if you use Google Earth, you can see runs right between Walker Lake and a mountain range. This creates a small area of highway that is affectionately known to the locals as the Cliffs. When I was 14, my grandparents, Mom, and I were coming home late from a long day of doctor's appointments in Reno. My grandfather was driving, and we hit the cliffs a little after 11.30 p.m. I was in the passenger seat to help keep my grandfather awake, but I still think it was just so I would sing folk songs with him. Anyway, about a third of the way around the cliffs, heading toward Hawthorne, there is a small area where the road pulls away from the mountain and creates a small outcove area. As we started to come up on it, we saw a large animal crossing the road, dragging another animal in its mouth, and it stopped in this outcove. Grandpa thought, at first, that I might get my first look at a live mountain lion, so he slowed down. When we got within a hundred feet of it, he turned on the brights of the car. To our surprise, it was no mountain lion. We only had a couple of seconds to look at it after Grandpa turned on the brights, because right after the light hit whatever the hell that thing was, it turned to look at us one second, and the next it leapt straight up on the side of the mountain, and out of sight, leaving the mangled body of a fox. Grandpa hit the gas, and the old Buick we were in jumped, waking up the woman in the back seat. I had never seen my grandfather truly scared before, but even he was physically shaking afterwards. I remember the sheer bulk of the thing, and the fact that it looked like a really large bodybuilder, when it jumped in the same fashion as a human, with its arms reaching up toward the rocks almost over its head. It had long, thick fur, but you could see the muscle definition. I don't remember the facial features, but I remember the pure terror when that thing turned and looked at the car with shining yellow eyes. I even pissed myself. I have come practically face to face with a polar bear, and I wasn't as scared as when we saw this thing. 
Now, I don't believe in werewolves, and I haven't seen anything like it since, but I never want to see that thing again. Story 10. Dogman in Nebraska. October 5th, 2016. My brother and I were waiting for our bus at our usual corner stop. It's about three blocks away from our house, and there's a pretty densely wooded creek near one to two blocks behind our bus stop. The first thing I noticed that was off was that my brother was standing completely rigid, staring intently down the long road. I shook him a little bit and asked what he was looking at. He shushed me almost immediately. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a large black shape darting on two legs across the street to the line of houses on the other side before disappearing. Thankfully, our bus arrived soon afterward, so we got out of there. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories, and don't forget if you like my content, subscribe and keep a lookout as I am constantly releasing new and scary encounters with creatures of all kinds. Tonight, we continue with part two, and the finale part of the Eastern Dogman Encounters in the United States series. 11 hair-raising encounters, ranging from Pennsylvania all the way to Maryland. Some of these stories even connect with one another, making it even more terrifying. Are you ready? Story 1 One morning around 6 a.m., about two years ago, I was living not far from Washington, D.C., a friend of a friend at the time needed a roommate to afford the rent for an apartment he had found. So when I was told about this, my first thought was, it's a chance to move out of my parents' house. After about six months of living in the area, I noticed that on certain nights, I would hear loud roars in the distance. I could never tell how far away the noise was coming from though. It would sometimes sound nearby or just far away enough where I wouldn't mind being outside to see what it might be making the sound from a safe distance. I lived in a quiet wooded area. A lot of people lived in the area. I actually lived within five minutes of walking distance away from the University of Maryland. One morning around 6 a.m., I just snapped awake from a deep sound sleep for really no reason at all. I started to go back to sleep, but thought to myself, why am I so wide awake and alert? It was very strange. I was completely awake. Then, right in my backyard, I hear a low, deep growl. That's when I knew something was up. The moment I heard that, I knew. That was why I had woken up. I remained quiet and didn't move for the next five to ten minutes as this thing started to become very active in my backyard. It went from low growls to heavy breathing. This thing's lungs had to be massive because it sounded the same exact way a horse would if you were standing right next to it. When it breathed through its nose, it sounded more like a horse, but this thing sounded like it was very aggressive. I knew it wasn't a horse in the backyard. That wouldn't be possible but what I saw was very real. It literally ran from my backyard into the dividing fence of my backyard, from my neighbor's backyard, again and again. It made no sense for it to be doing that. It would often stop and sniff around and sneeze very loudly. It sounded like it was right next to my window and I was on the second floor. I didn't want to look out the window because I thought that there was no way in the world no one else is hearing this right now but me. I thought, this thing is trying to get my attention on purpose. I still stayed in bed without moving and I was beyond scared. I really thought it was a werewolf, even before I ever saw it. I always thought that they were real. The guys that lived below me started screaming and yelling, El Diablo, over and over again. I could hear the thing leaving the backyard so I hurried to try and get a look at it. When I did, all I saw was its backside. This thing was massive with broad shoulders, just like a bodybuilder. 
and it had ears sticking up on top of its head. It slowly walked away until I lost total sight of it. Story 2 2017 Not sure what it is. My girlfriend and I were hiking around western Maryland, and I started getting an eerie feeling, and I seen something following and stalking us. But it wasn't as big as what I'd heard these dogmen to be. Also, there's a little equipment yard where I work sometimes on vehicles, and behind the yard is a cornfield, and it had been cut down, and in the middle of this field is an island of trees. While I was working one afternoon, I heard what sounded like 50 wolves howling at once. I turned around and seen something crouching down, very low to the ground, coming out of the island of the trees. It looked a lot like the thing had been following my girlfriend and I, but that was at least 20 miles away. Also, there's an area nearby where my father told me that he and his friends would see this wolfman thing running next to their vehicle in the 1960s and supposedly had killed a lot of livestock in the area. I came across this article of something called the Snarly Yow. It was on the same mountain my father has all these werewolf stories about. I would try to get you the article. The area around Hagerstown, Maryland. Story 3 I have a sighting to report. My old neighbor, who committed suicide shortly after his experience, came to me with his experience. We were both registered Maine guides for hunting, fishing, and recreation. Guiding in Maine is a serious business. The criteria are strict, and guides are expert woodsmen with years of outdoors experience. Anyway, he confided in me about this sighting. He was hunting on his own property during deer season of 2011. So for those that aren't familiar with hunting season, specifically with deer, that generally falls in October, November. The property is located on the Jefferson Washington town lines, which are also the Knox Lincoln County lines in Maine. The particular property is a Christmas tree farm and is private property. My friend was watching a run where deer regularly traveled cutting through his property. He observed for a minute a bipedal creature walking with its upper body well above his Christmas trees. It had a wolf's head, was muscular, and covered in hair, but walking like a man. At the end of the sighting, the creature dropped to all fours and took off down the run. He was shaking when he told me the story, and based upon my few years working in law enforcement, I don't believe he was lying. Both of us guided for bear hunters at the time, and I know he was very familiar with bears, and Maine wildlife in general. He made a particular emphasis on the pointed ears. He said it looked like a werewolf. In Maine, people do see these things, and generally call them wendigos. After that sighting, I carried a firearm going to my barn that night. I am certain that he told me the truth. Unfortunately. He, for some reason, committed suicide shortly after he told me about the sighting, which was very fresh at the time. The area has some large tracts of woods, with very limited access due to it being private property. There is a stream passing through the area, and some high ridges. Also, old cellar holes and stone walls are scattered throughout the forest behind the property. Food sources are plentiful in the area with old apple trees, berry patches, deer, turkey, etc. Bears are present in the area, but not in huge numbers. Moose are also present, but again, not in huge numbers. While I still own a house in a very near spot, I have moved to South Dakota and have no intention of moving back to Maine ever, due to political economic reasons, of course. I am curious if other Maine folks have seen these things. It seems to me that people have, but always in hushed conversations about an uncle. Story 4 The Martin family had downsized their lives. A workplace injury had devastated Eric, and Shelley had left her job to take care of her husband. 
As a result, they were looking for a less expensive place to live. Shelley had found a beautiful older farmhouse in Palmyra that was just what they needed. It was surrounded by dense woods. Eric's family had always been hunters, and his fairly extensive collection of guns was a bone of contention with Shelley. With the help of Eric's son, Sean, Eric built a strong box to hold the guns under lock and key in the barn. Eric and Shelley had a routine of evening coffee on the sheltered porch, provided it wasn't too cold out. One night, they noticed strange pulsating lights down past the tree line. At first, Sean thought it was just a poacher with a flashlight, but something didn't seem right. Shelley thought it was unnatural. Eric and Sean headed out to the field to investigate further. As they approached the woods, the lights went out. It was so quiet, the snap of a tree branch underfoot echoed. Eric sent Sean around with his flashlight op, hoping to catch any potential poacher unaware. Eric felt something far beyond any fear he'd ever felt hunting. All Eric and Sean found was each other. Not even a track on the ground to give them a hint of what they'd seen. Chelsea's boyfriend Nathan came for a visit, and they decided to go for a walk in the woods with the dogs. The dogs ran out ahead of them, catching a scent. When Chelsea and Nathan caught up, the dogs were rooting around by a large hole in the ground. Nathan thought the overly round hole had been dug with care. Chelsea had a bad feeling about the whole thing and urged him to leave. Finally, he did agree. What had the dogs found? It was Memorial Day weekend and Shelley was making the evening coffee. The dogs didn't want to go outside to their pen. Something wasn't right. Eric noticed that it was particularly quiet on this misty evening. When Eric heard an odd sound in the distance, he knew there was some sort of danger out there. Eric began to usher Shelley into the house. She protested, but when she heard some rustling in the distance, accompanied by five sets of eyes looking back at them, she realized the danger. They rushed into the house and locked the door. Eric knew it wasn't a bear, but it was huge and dangerous. The guns were all the way in the barn and Eric wasn't sure his family was safe in the house. Eric wanted to go get the guns, but Shelly told him to stay. She went up to Chelsea's room and woke her daughter. Chelsea was half awake when she looked out the window, but laid back down and went back to sleep. All five of the creatures were still there. One stood on its hind legs and looked right at Shelly. Eric felt an instinct to protect his family. With the creatures in the distance, he thought he might be able to get the family car backed up close enough to get them out. Even with his disability, Eric went outside. Shelley went through the house, closing all the windows. She finally found the two hunting dogs hiding in a shadowed corner. If the dogs were scared, Shelley was concerned. When Eric reached the porch, he realized that he might have the distance to get there. It was going to be the longest 20 feet of his life. He started to slowly walk toward the car. When he finally reached it, grabbing the keys and trying to unlock the door, the motion sensor lights popped on. Eric was frightened and very vulnerable in that very moment. Suddenly, he was face to face with one of the creatures. It tried to reach into the light, but something stopped it. It bolted off into the darkness. Eric made for the house as quickly as he could. They decided to call the police immediately hoping for someone else to drive in while they remained sheltered. The police didn't take them seriously, telling Shelley to close the windows and lock the doors. Nobody was coming. They were entirely on their own. Shelley heard them approach. They were on the other side of the outside wall, and if they wanted in, they were going to get in. Her family was being held hostage in their own house by these beasts. They weren't able to get the guns. There weren't any police coming. What were they going to do? Grabbing every sharp implement they could find, Shelley went and woke up Chelsea. They needed all hands awake and alert. They all went to the master bedroom and laid on top of the bed, armed and waiting on daylight to come. When they heard the creatures outside, they were petrified. The only thing between the Martins and the creatures was the bedroom window now. 
When morning came, they could finally breathe a sigh of relief. The creatures were gone. Eric called Sean, who came over and helped look for tracks. The tracks they did find were huge, with enormous claws. They showed a creature who could walk on two feet. These creatures had been hunting and stalking. Were they werewolves? To this day, nobody knows. Story 5 2001 I'm a night owl. I always stay up late at night and watch TV. I just happened to look at my window one night and saw what I initially thought was a man sitting on a roof. I thought it was a man because at first he looked almost naked until I saw the hair or fur on him. He then turned his face and what I saw then was frightening. He had a pointed ears like a dog and a long snout. They were almost like a German shepherd's ears. I could not understand what I was looking at. I just stared at him for a few minutes. I felt like if I moved, it would see me. It just sat there on its butt, with human looking arms and legs, but with hair or fur covering them. I backed away from the window very slowly and went to tell my husband. He didn't want to get up and go look because he thought I was imagining it. I went back to the window and it was gone. I don't know or understand what I saw that night, but I did tell my husband and kids what I saw. It has haunted me for many years until I was just telling a few of my grandchildren recently at camp. One of them got on the computer and found some pictures of what they thought I meant. It was terrifying. I was looking at the same thing I saw on the roof that night. I cannot believe it. As I sit here looking at that picture I did not know, it really existed many, many years ago. Story 6 November 1987 I was hunting during doe season in the woods. I parked my truck on a side road in Washington County, but it was right on the border near Greene County. Anyway, I was in a tree stand looking for deer and heard a lot of rustling leaves near me. I then saw this wolf-like thing running on its hind legs. It stopped for a moment, sniffed the air, and then ran off. I sat there in that tree stand for hours till the sun was high in the sky. Then I cautiously returned to my truck. I gave up hunting after this experience. Story 7 Date Unknown an eyewitness was driving home from work on Route 66 near the Green Gauge Mall around 9 p.m. His headlights picked up a large, canine looking creature running across the road. When it reached the side of the road, it dropped to all fours and crawled under a fence that surrounded a power transformer. The eyewitness stated that the creature had a snout like a dog and was covered in hair. The eyewitness pulled over and grabbed his flashlight went around the fence site and found a dugout area about two feet deep at the fence. Story 8 Date Unknown A woman and her daughter were out walking their dog in the evening by a cemetery before dark, right before a thunderstorm. The daughter got bored and decided to go back to the vehicle and wait for her mom to finish the walk. While in the car, she saw a bipedal werewolf with a snout that was about five feet tall in height, that had grayish fur and darkened eyes. The creature came out of the bushes and then walked around the vehicle once and went back into the bushes. It made eye contact with the daughter, who was frozen in terror. When the mother returned to the car, the daughter was hysterical with fear. The mom believes the daughter and doesn't think she was lying. They seem to think that it is a possible situation, that the approaching thunder electrical storm was used as an energy source by the creature to manifest into this world. This cemetery is on the outskirts of town in a rural area. Lots and lots of woods and creeks, great habitat for it. Daughter was absolutely certain that the creature was not a Bigfoot. It had a wolf-like snout and very wolf-like features. This area of Pennsylvania has a lot of weird witchcraft and other strange phenomenon. 
Story 9 In the fall of 1991, between 9.30 and 10.30 p.m., the eyewitness, after spotlighting for deer, came home and went looking for his friends and found them by the old water company. His friends had told him that they had just seen this creature. They shined the spotlight after hearing the noise and saw the creature standing by a telephone pole. Again, the wolf-like creature was standing on two legs. It ran into the woods and they did not see it again. The next day, they took a measuring tape and measured from where the creature's head was just under a spike in the pole and it measured seven feet from the ground. The Mercer County area has been a hotbed of dogman sightings since the 1960s with many of the sightings coming from the Shenango Reservoir. Story 10 2007 and 2010 My husband was on his way to work around 4 a.m. on a rural road while rounding an S bend when his headlights hit a large, dark brown figure that was sitting about 30 feet off the road watching the road intently. He described the figure as about four feet tall sitting with legs bent out in front of it. Wolf-like face and large pointed ears. Although does not remember eye shine, it was leaning back on human-like arms. My husband immediately felt endangered and floored his vehicle accelerator. This man has no fear of humans. I've known him for 30 years and have never seen him afraid of a natural being. He's hunted and fished since childhood. It took him a couple of years before he told me about this sighting. He said his first thought was that this thing can catch his car, rip me out and eat me if it wants to. He was paranoid and had his head on a swivel all that day. Still though, to this day he cannot drive past that location without feeling something weird. The second sighting occurred in 2010 and happened to a coworker. I noticed she was acting strangely whenever we talked about spooky things. So I asked her what was up, and she said, Okay, don't think I'm crazy. Then she went on to tell me how one night she was driving home from a late second shift between midnight and 1am, about 5 or so miles from where the first sighting had occurred. She had to slow down to a near stop to turn onto a road that would take her home. That's when she began to hear what sounded like running alongside her car. That's when she glanced out her driver's window and saw the most horrible, evil-looking wolf face. Her first thought was that it was a werewolf. She described it as being black and gray in color, with very large teeth. She said she didn't look again, but could hear it running next to her car until she reached roughly 50 miles an hour. That's no joke on a back road. She was scared out of her wits. After arriving home, she ran to the door, dropped the keys, went inside, closed all the curtains, and did not sleep a wink that night. We're both nurses, and I've known her for about seven years. She grew up in New York and is not a storyteller. Neither of these people like to talk about their sightings. You can see a change in them when encounters are brought up. I don't need to see one to believe them. I know they exist. Story 11 The Shenango Valley, nestled in Mercer County, is a scenic wonder. The tranquil waters of the Shenango Lake belly the fact that a legendary creature may stalk the surrounding countryside. Strange sightings of an unknown animal began to occur around the mid-1950s and continue possibly through the present day. The local residents dubbed this creature the Shenango Valley Werewolf. Margie was walking with her mother and several young friends when suddenly, from behind her, she heard a howling noise. Quickly, she turned around and stared in horror as the figure was running toward her on all four legs. When the creature reached her, it stood up on its hind legs and grabbed her and started to pull her down the road. Her mother, who was standing only several feet in front of her, grabbed Margie's hand and quickly yanked her away from the strange beast. The creature quickly turned and ran back down the gravel road from where it came. The creature was again spotted several days later near an abandoned house at the end of the road where the initial sighting took place.
This time, the creature was seen to be wearing a blue shirt and pants. The creature, after being observed, quickly ran away into the woods. The creature was dubbed Dog Boy by the locals in the 1950s throughout the 1970s. Sightings of this creature were rumored to have been seen throughout the area. Sometimes it had been seen by the Shenango Lake, while other times loud howls were heard throughout the entire area. Flash forward to 2010. Our research group, the Center for Unexplained Events, had a vendor table at a local paranormal conference. The event dubbed Maps Con, which is Mysteries and Paranormal Society, was nearing completion when Margie came over to our table and read the flyer. Have you seen this creature? On the flyer was a depiction of a canine looking werewolf creature. I saw something strange like that, Margie had stated. We went on to interview her, and she explained her encounter to us. She described the creature as follows. The creature was dark brown, about four feet tall, and hair covered over the entire body. One of its arms appeared to be almost deformed. The hands seemed cloven. The face appeared flat. The one feature that stood out was the eyes. The eyes appeared to sag. In June of 2014, we went to the location of sighting in Jefferson Township, Mercer County, Pennsylvania, and photographed the sighting area. The questions remain, what did she and all of the other eyewitnesses encounter? A deformed child with an extreme amount of hair all over the body, called the werewolf syndrome, or was it an unknown cryptid? Was it an interdimensional creature trapped in our realm and unable to travel back to its own dimension? The phenomenon then changed course in the 1990s with the next wave of sightings. The creature being observed was much bigger and its appearance was now more wolf-like. The Center for Unexplained Events interviewed an eyewitness about a series of encounters beginning in the spring of 1990. Mark was walking with several friends near where he lived in Mercer County, Pennsylvania, when they heard a noise at a nearby park. He shined his flashlight up towards the park when he was startled by what they observed. In the glow of the flashlight stood a huge dog-like creature that was feeding on an animal. The light made it stand up on its hind legs and turn toward the boys. The creature looked like a man with a dog or more wolf-like face. It quickly ran into the woods, leaving a wet dog-like odor. The boys soon departed after that, and very swiftly. The next day, they found a deer that was eaten and broken branches about six feet off the ground. The next encounter took place the following year in the fall of 91. The same eyewitnesses came home from fishing and decided to look for his friends. He drove by an old water company in his neighborhood and found them. They appeared upset, and they stated that they had just spotted the wolf-like creature again. It had just ran to the woods before Mark arrived at the water company. They drove by an old dirt road close to the water company. Mark shined the spotlight down the road and saw the creature standing by an old utility pole. The creature quickly departed after seeing the light shining in its face and fled back into the wood line. The next day, the group went back to the spot looking for evidence. Although they didn't find any physical evidence, the group measured a spike in the utility pole where the creature was standing beside it and measured seven feet tall. The creature was described as wolf-like, covered in grayish, whitish hair, and its eyes glowed red. The legend, even dating back into the 1950s, of the dog boy seemed to center around the idea that a satanic cult, or even a coven of witches, conjured up the creature to protect the land. Ironically, after an old red abandoned house, which was said to be where the creature was summoned from, was torn down and the sightings appeared to have stopped. What exactly was the Shenango Valley Werewolf? Did the sightings really stop, or did people stop reporting them? A second-hand report was given to author Thomas White in the 2000s of a strange beast with dark fur allegedly encountered behind a home near Hermitage. The eyewitness still refuses to disclose any information about the sighting. If you are in Shenango Valley area at night and happen to hear a howl or something moving about in the forest, perhaps you too will encounter the Shenango Valley Werewolf.
This video concludes our dogmen of Eastern United States, but very soon we will start the Southern United States Dogmen Encounter series, where we will touch upon some of the scariest encounters out there. For now, stay in the light and be safe. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you like it, be sure to hit that like button and be sure to leave a comment. Subscribe to my channel for more terrifying cryptid videos and other horror stories. Tonight, we begin part two of our Southern US Dogman series. We have a lot of good, spooky tales for you tonight. Encounters ranging from Missouri, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Let's jump into the swamps of the South and prepare ourselves for the next round of werewolf and dogman encounters. Enjoy. Story 1 November 19th, 2015. I was rolling the trash cans out for pickup the next day. It was late, so I grabbed a flashlight. I walked out to the back door, unlocked the gate, and was dragging the can. While walking backwards, as I passed the fence, it blocked my view of my neighbor's garage. That's when my light hit this wolf creature. I froze instantly. The creature was about 20 feet away, and I could clearly see that it was crouching. When our eyes met, it turned to its right and fell to all fours, and leapt my neighbor's driveway in one solid jump. That driveway is about 12 feet wide. The creature was about 8 feet tall and maybe 300 pounds. It looked kind of thin around the waist, but it was very muscular. I dropped the trash can and panic set in. I ran inside, grabbed my gun, and locked myself in my room. I've never felt fear like that before ever. When the light hit its eyes, they were vibrant, yellow, and menacing. His fur was short and charcoal colored. I could hear the clicking of his claws, and when he dropped down on all fours is when I saw it. I thought I was seeing things. I didn't sleep a wink that night. It made me really question my sanity. Furthermore, it made me seek a concealed carry weapons permit. Just a few nights ago, I heard something whimpering. When it was just starting to get dark, I slammed my window shut and hit the lights. I laid in bed with my AR-15 all night that night. Story 2 Date Unknown I should start off explaining that my partner and I are experienced Bigfoot investigators who are in a unique situation as we have family group living in our research area. Last October, during the full moon, my partner and I were on our hilltop, having quite a bit of success with two juveniles and one adult that we noticed. We could hear them walking in the leaf litter, and every once in a while, we could also hear a clack or wood knock from the different directions. After a while, it seemed the feeling of fun for them dissipated and became a lot more cautious. Mike heard something to our north, and went a ways down to investigate while I stayed by the camp, just to make sure it wasn't a diversion. He came back in a rush and said he had seen one of the young ones come out of the woods line, running for the other side of the fire break, and what was following, he said he couldn't comprehend. It was about six feet tall, with pointy ears and a long snout. At this point, I have to say that neither of us have given any creed to the whole dogman, wolfman, grassman theory. We just thought it was a mistaken identification of a Bigfoot or even a bear. I had purchased a 40 caliber handgun and some hydro shock ammunition for it earlier that day, so it was in my vehicle. After Mike had explained what he had seen, I retrieved my weapon and loaded it. All the while, we could hear the two young ones chattering and the big ones stomping all to our backside. They were pissed or upset about something, and they never acted that way with us. I had Mike take me down the fire break to where he saw this creature, and with spotlights, we scanned the entirety of the area. We could hear something moving around and a few short growls. Finally, Mike caught it with the spotlight going between trees, 
and what I witnessed is something I would have never dreamed of seeing except on the Hollywood screen. A six foot wolf walking on its hind legs. I fired my weapon in the air and it turned to the southeast into the woods. We cautiously made our way back to camp, but we could hear this thing pacing us to our left. As we got back to camp, we kept listening to this thing approaching us from the woods. Mike turned on the spotlight and I leveled my gun wherever the sound was coming from. It was approaching us without fear and it felt too like both of us like it was stalking us as it was just one of our juvies that Mike had witnessed. It came out from between the trees and I shot it square in the ribs at about 20 yards. We measured the next day and I am a very good shot. I saw the wound and know without a doubt I hit the son of a bitch. It fell to the ground but immediately got up and ran to the southeast. We could hear it crash through the brush and we even heard it fall down or trip over something but it continued to head in pretty much a southerly direction down the hill paralleling the fire break. We were both freaked out by this time and broke camp and left. The next morning, I loaded up a few extra clips and we went back to see if it had died somewhere close or was just wounded, so we felt we had to track it down. We did track it from the point of where I shot it, all the way down the canyon and even found where it made such a ruckus when it fell. The leaf litter was all ended up and was fairly easy to track. At one point, we did a perfect canine track in a mud ridge but it was over eight inches across. The thing that absolutely baffled the both of us was that there was no blood trail whatsoever. Literally none. We both saw the bullet hit, yet no blood. We tracked it all the way down the canyon until we lost the trail. We talked to a Native American couple we know and they immediately said Skinwalker. We contacted a few other investigators just to try and figure out what the hell happened and what we were dealing with. I mentioned before that neither of us took any creed from any dogman reportings, but I do know that neither of us wants to experience it again, and I have never gone out in the woods unarmed since. Story 3 Almost three years ago now, it was almost fall. I was heading up to get my husband from his mother's house, about an hour away from where we live. It was dark. The road had just turned into a gravel road. There is woods on one side and a creek and commercial farm on the other side. This dark gray thing came from the creek side and jumped across the road. I can make out its back end, but definitely saw a tail like a dog's. I told him and his mom that I saw a donkey running across the road in front of me, but the tail looked like a dog's tail. I get laughed at for it, but I did stop my car and get out to look for the animal thinking someone had lost a pet. A car pulled up but kept going. I was hoping they would stop and ask me what was going on, but that didn't happen. I stood there for a couple of seconds and thought it was a dumb idea. A lot of horror movies start out like that after all, but that was the full extent of the sighting. Story 4 I saw three of them eating something big and bloody in a field. They saw me, stopped eating, and followed me back to the farm when I got out of there. This happened to me more than 50 years ago. It was forbidden to talk about in the family, lest the neighbors think we were crackpots. Now all the old folks are gone, and I've told my children about what I saw that day. They said I should write it down, but I think I'll leave that up to them to do. There were other strange things going on in the area, but at the time, we didn't connect them together. If the aunts and uncles did know what was going on, they wouldn't tell us kids a thing. It's been cathartic to talk about and I'm so pleased to see that others have seen them too. But I have to tell you, to think back on something I've tried to forget for over 50 years is terrible. It was so frightening, I haven't been able to get a good night of sleep. Thinking back on all that gore and those things' faces, 
I truly believe they would have eaten me if they hadn't already just eaten. When I finally told where and what happened, I was called a bald-faced liar and given a good beating. Then, the folks went to the field and to the truck that I hid in and saw the gore, blood, scratches, prints and all. Later, an uncle up the road, about five miles, had these prints come up to his house. He took pictures of them, and there was a newspaper article about some sort of huge cat prowling around. I don't know if that has anything to do with those critters or not. A neighboring farm that was owned by a wealthy family, compared to us, had a prized bull go missing. I bet that had something to do with those things. He was a huge thing, and very ornery. They never found a trace. I know this is choppy and not quite clear, but it still makes me nervous to talk about, even after all this time. Story 5 This occurred in early December 2011 at around 2 a.m. in the morning. A friend and I were sitting in my bedroom hanging out whenever we both noticed something moving on my surveillance monitor. I had a camera pointed down my driveway so I could see whenever I had company drive up. When we both looked, I saw what appeared to be a large canine running on all fours in mid-run. This thing came up on its hind legs and continued running across my field and across my driveway and into my brother's field on two legs. I was in shock and my friend immediately turned to me with her mouth wide open. I asked her, What did you just see? And she replied with, Well, what did you see? I saw where this was going, so I then asked her, How many legs was it running on? And she just replied with, It was running on all four, but went to two. I then had a cold chill run through my body, as I knew she saw exactly what I had. I jumped up and grabbed my night vision scope I had recently purchased and I ran to the front of my door with my friend right behind me. I must admit I was hesitant to open that door for fear of it maybe standing right there. So I opened the door while letting out a roar as to maybe shock it if it was there, but it wasn't. Hey, I didn't know. I cautiously walked out on my front porch and took the scope and scanned the front field. There was nothing to be seen, nor do I know which direction it went in besides where I had just seen it last. I waited until daybreak and went out to where it crossed my driveway, and I found a paw print that was a good 12 inches by 12 inches. I was stunned. I just stood there looking back at the woods it had came from and looked south to where it was headed. I had no way to save the print and didn't think to take a picture at the time, nor was my camera recording at the time of sighting either. From what I could see on camera, this thing was massive in its upper body. I can still remember seeing the muscles flexing and the muscularity in its upper back as it came to a full height. It was running in weeds that came to my waist, but on all fours, it was a good two feet above them and when it went to full height, I would estimate it to be a good 8 feet tall. Due to the camera showing only black and white, I didn't get to see its color, but I could tell you it was dark. Its head is something else, and that stands out as I could watch and see the snout and its pointed ears which were laid back whenever it went to two legs. I am an R&D technician, so I am trained to watch for details, and even though this thing was moving fast, faster than any human, I was so transfixed on its form and what I was seeing. It was headed south and into property that connects to Stennis Space Center's buffer zone, which is just over 100,000 acres of untouched and uninhabited acreage that was put aside just for the space shuttle program in Hancock County since the mid-60s, so it has all the resources it needs in order to survive in those woods and to go undetected. I have always been an outdoors man, but since that sighting, I will not go out in the woods without a gun on me now. 
I know for a fact I do not want to run into that thing up close. Story 6 This will be a brief summary, because if I wrote most of the entire encounter here, well, it's just way too long. On July 4th, 2016, just a few days ago now, two girlfriends and myself decided to raft down the Chattahoochee River and spend time at the Diving Rock and laugh at all the drunks enjoying their holiday. This is a North Georgia summer tradition going way back to the 60s. I am 47 now, but in my youth I did it quite a few times and damn near killed myself doing a gainer off the diving rock when I landed on my belly, inhaled some water and nearly drowned. I was fairly drunk and don't remember how I made it back to the surface, but my upper body was purple the next day and my internal organs, well, they hurt for quite a few weeks. The river was way down that year. Gosh, I wanted to say it was maybe 1988, so that made the big flat rock at least 25 feet high off the river. Most people chickened out once they got up there. Anyhow, so this past Monday, after at least 28 years, we were back, but sober now since I haven't drank alcohol in well over 10 years. I had to answer the call of nature number two, so I had to walk very far back into the dense woods because of all the people, which was roughly 15 or so, waiting to jump. Having nothing but my bathing suit, I walked much further so I could try and find something akin to toilet tissue. Finally, after I reached a small clearing surrounded by old growth pines, I began doing my business. As I am squatting in a very vulnerable position, out walks in broad daylight an enormous canine type creature. Now, I need to tell you, I spent 21 years in an army, all over the world in three different theaters of war, and I have never even heard of this creature before. In the three days since, I have barely slept at all, researching everything in a zombified state. I can still taste the fear in my throat and my own vomit. I am six foot tall and about 250 solid pounds, and this thing dwarfed me, at least seven foot six, and gosh, maybe 400 pounds. As a former college and semi-pro football player and power lifter, I know about big people and about strength and musculature, and this was no normal creature that evolved somehow in that environment. This is some kind of genetically mixed entity of man, wolf, and primate. My encounter with it lasted for only minutes, but it displayed very bizarre behavior and vocalized several times at me. It stunk so bad and horrified me so badly that I retched again, again, and again. I was gone so long that the girls came looking for me and they are what finally scared this thing off. When they found me, I was trembling and couldn't speak. As a combat lifesaver in the army, I can tell you for certain that I was in shock from this. Every joint in my body and my ab muscles are still hurting after three days, so I will be more than willing to share everything with you in the hopes that I can relieve my anxiety, but just expressing my trauma. Because I'm not sure what type I saw, but I can promise you that this is not something that anyone would want to encounter twice. I am not grateful, and I don't fear privileged, and I will not chase after this thing with a camera. Story 7 September 2015 This took place three weeks ago, while driving home from an event with my fiancé. It was already dark out and was raining when we hit the road this night. I, myself, was driving and my fiancé was in the passenger seat. We had been driving for about 15 minutes at most when we got to a part of the road where I had noticed a rather large figure in the opposite lane of the two-way road. It seemed to be on all fours and was grayish in color. It was very quick, which was startling, given the conditions after all. I asked my fiancé if she had seen it. She just said yes, but seemed spooked about it. 
I wanted to stop but couldn't because there was another car only about a hundred feet behind us. I also didn't look back because I didn't want to stay focused on that thing. I would rather my focus be on the road because of the poor conditions and the fact that we were in an area we never had been in until that night. I truly don't think it was a cow from what I saw even with the fleeting glimpse I had of it. Its hair was much more canine-like than anything else. I would have to conclude that it was a dogman or a Bigfoot. I definitely wish I would have been able to get a longer look at it during the daytime. It was within feet of my door, but because it happened so quickly, and the fact I kept my focus on the road instead of turning to look at it, I didn't see it clearly. That's pretty much my encounter to a T. Story 8 There are poultry farms located east of Shreveport. In November of 2017, there have been incidents of dogman encounters on this farm. The footprints, dead chickens, sightings, and even farmers shooting at the creature with shotguns, rifles, and pistols. Video taken by one of the overseers on duty. What is bad? is that there are several other farms over the area that have had these werewolf encounters, and it's bad for business. We must have the wildlife agents deal with tracking them to their lair of residence and terminating the damn things. The frequency of incidents is more and more. These farmers are not in the mood to have their lives torn by these dogmen, and unless dealt with now, they will only do more damage. As far as being broadcast to the general public about these demons and their doings, they are not informed, and the cappers that prevail are unchecked by most area farmers and residents. This story should be a wake-up call for the law enforcement community and the area farmers as well as the citizens to make a stand against these werewolf dogmen things. Story 9 as county parish SWAT team members and law enforcement officers, we spend a lot of time training in the bayous and wooded areas around Shreveport, Louisiana. The need to crawl through thick woods and creeks and bayou settings is a necessity. Well sir, my friend and Deputy Jim and I could not believe the creature we encountered last week in the swamp. A dogman looking werewolf type of thing that we crept up on over by the old rice mills and took some pictures of the area. We were actually scared shitless, so we kept our distance and checked its movement. This thing walking around on its hind legs, so we decided to check it out and go watch it as it closed in on us. This dog thing was heading for our training area and we then decided to take the creek to beat it out of our camp. The dogman werewolf thing came up the fence line and then stayed in the shrubbery just to see us. My partner Jim shot around over its head and saw the reaction. Well, the dog critter to walk away towards the woods where he comes another one up the old road and this one was looking for us. We laid down and spotted the dogman with our scopes and checked his motion as he walked towards us. He stopped in the road just seven feet away from us. He was sniffing the air trying to get a scent. We did not move for one minute. He then went to his buddy and they walked away into the woods. Both Jim and I were fearful of them, even though we were armed and ready to kill. We waited five minutes, then went to our vehicles to write a report on this incident which our supervisors said was a bunch of hogwash and he would see us again Monday morning. So we had our encounter not knowing what these creatures were and what to do. We will think twice when we go into the dark Louisiana bayous again. Thanks and stay safe. Story 10 May 2010 Hunterbone my German Shepherd hunting dog and myself went early to hunt this morning at 5.45. Along the old abandoned railroad bridge that crosses the bayou close to my home in the town of Crowley, Louisiana, 70,526 population. As it was early, there was a humid fog and dark enough not to see a thing. As we walked slowly in between the rails of this old set of rusty railroad tracks, 
Hunter Bones stopped and looked ahead down the rails as if he heard or sensed something. With nothing in view, we continued along only for Hunter Bone to stop abruptly once again. What is it, boy? A raccoon? A rabbit? What suddenly a huge hairy dog thing came out of the fog down the rails standing on its hind legs, upright. Oh shit, I was terrified and fearful and raised my Remington 12 gauge to fire off two rounds of buckshot over this wolf thing's head. Bam, bam. The critter howled loudly and turned to run back to the rails across the old bridge. And I could hear the son of a bitch as he snapped shrubbery and foliage in the distance. Hunterbone and I ran back towards the pickup, and I had turned about 50 yards to fire two more rounds for insurance, so we would make it home. As we got in the truck, we hauled Boggy Fast back to the main road that leads to Crowley. As we pulled into Exxon gas station, I saw a Louisiana state trooper and explained my ordeal to him. He said he has had hairy dog creatures run in front of his cruiser at night, and it disturbed him greatly but that the thing always heads off into the woods or jumps off the road. Well, okay, I'm going to go home and chill out later. As I sat in my home, I tried to rationalize what the hell I just experienced and why. For one thing, after 25 years of bayou hunting, why the hell did I not ever hear of this creature or even experience it? This encounter will keep me from hunting alone in the future. This really rattled my chain for certain, and I suggest to you if you are going to hunt here in the south of Louisiana by yourself, you as well better be prepared. Well sir, be safe and be watchful. Story 11 April 18th, 1998 Down the railroad tracks about two miles is an old nursery, the Ziegler Plant Nursery. The old couple, the Zigglers, are both now dead, but the five-acre homestead is now owned by a veterinarian, Dr. Artal, who lives on the property. The previous owners reported two werewolf creatures jumping a fence in broad daylight as their children watched in horror. The daughter and son jumped on top of the car, spellbound. Later, encounters had the werewolf excrement poop on the front porch. The state wildlife authorities came and filed a report but they could not identify the poop or the tracks of paw prints at all as listed in any logged familiar comparison to identified species known. So, come to find out, this homestead is built on an Indian burial ground. Imagine that. I called Mrs. Ziegler after her husband died. She stated she had a loaded firearm in every room and a holy cross on every room. As of 2010, Miss Ziegler also passed away. I recently went to the Crowley Barbershop, and an elderly gentleman said he once was the gardener, maintenance, and grass mower at the Ziegler Plant Nursery many years ago, and when he would go inside the house, objects would move on their own, and the furniture and beads would shake violently, and crosses would spin upon the walls. Obviously, there seems to be some sort of strange connection between the paranormal and these werewolf creatures. I hope you enjoyed part two to this series. If you like my content, feel free to subscribe, leave a comment, and be sure to like, as it helps me out tremendously. There are many great encounters to come, and there have been many of you requesting more parts to come for the other Dogman series, like the Eastern and Western encounters, and I promise you, I got many good things cooking up for you folks. There will be more parts coming and a lot of other cool encounters coming down the pipeline. Stay tuned.